Welcome back to the Reptiles and Research podcast, hosted by myself, Liam Sinclair, and Ellie Hills. Today's guest is Heather Moy of Fairy Tale Dragons. Now, she is a bearded dragon breeder, a long term bearded dragon breeder, who breeds bearded dragons outside in Florida. Now, this is a really good episode. I'm really hoping you guys enjoy it. I actually enjoyed this conversation immensely. It's I'm still thinking about it to this day. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Custom Reptile Habitats. Now, Custom Reptile Habitats is an excellent option for those of you that are looking for PVC enclosures, or if you're looking to convert your wooden vivarium or solid top vivarium to screen top. If you actually use the code Reptiles and Research, you get a 10% discount on Custom Reptile Habitats screen conversion kits. If you would like to get involved and support the podcast and put your own questions ahead of time to these guests before they come on, then you can head over to Patreon slash Reptiles and Research. So, without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast, Heather. Would you be so kind as to tell us who you are and uh, what it is you do? Um, well, my name is Heather, obviously. Um, I've been breeding dragons for nearly 20 years, I guess, um, along with other species as well. We're currently keeping approximately 14 species. So bearded dragons are where most of my experience, most of my time has been with, um, but have expanded quite a bit over the last number of years. So what was it you would say that originally drew you to bearded dragons? Um, honestly, honestly, an ex-husband, I bought him a scorpion, which led to a ball python, which led to a rainbow boa, which led to, and he had difficulty, um, maintaining a job. So he decided that he would buy and resell. So he would go down to uh, the importers and pick up animals and I would come home from work and there would be a whole bunch of new species that had just shown up in my house. So, um, he really... Anyway, I spent a tremendous amount of time doing a lot of research to find out exactly how animals need to be kept, what they needed, how they differed, you know, so that they were being, uh, so that they were thriving and spent a lot of time with a, a wide variety of species. The bearded dragons, the frilled dragons, and the euros were just ones that I happened to be drawn to. I enjoyed them. Um, so I started to acquire um, babies from reputable breeders in the States, um, grew them up. Uh, I started off with breeding just um, one pair of dragons, uh, just a single pair, kind of get the hang of things, which I think is really important. A lot of people don't do that. They rush right in, they kind of get the bug and they're like, oh my God, I have to have, um, you know, 20 dragons and I've got all these pairings lined up. And you know, that's, that's one of the things that I think really goes wrong um, is everybody just gets really excited. They're, they're kind of like the Pokemon where you got to have them all type thing. Everybody gets, you know, they have to have X number of pairs. Um, and then they end up with a mess because they're not able to, they don't have the experience. They haven't like, you know, learned about all these little itty bitty things that one may not think is a big deal, but really is a big deal. Um, they don't establish their contacts, this, that, and that other. So Really, I just started with one pair, just kind of get my feet wet, see if I really enjoyed it. Um, the following season, I did three pairs. Um, when I kind of parted ways with him, I took my dragons with me. And, you know, after um, the divorce was finalized and this, that, and the other, then I formed Fairy Tale Dragons, um, which was in 2009, and been kind of going with it ever since. So, yeah. And obviously, all of this is in Florida, isn't it? Yes. So from our European brains, we think Florida and we think really high humidity. I don't know if that is always the case, but what drove you to pick like an arid species for that sort of climate? It's a valid question. So initially my, um, my breeding was all indoors. So everything I did was indoors for quite a number of years. So it's only been in the last four seasons that, um, that I've done outdoor keeping. Um, Ron St. Pierre, whom I'm obviously with, uh, he has extensive outdoor experience. So I was able to learn from him uh, and he has been doing outdoor breeding for about 30 years. So, um, you know, we've been able to, that's, that has been uh, a skill that, that I've been, you know, in the process of mastering over the last four years, which actually comes quite easy to me now. But when I first put them outside, it was completely different. It was completely different experience. I mean, it was it was night and day that husband i mean everything is so different 
what was it that initially made you make that scary jump because I can imagine it being so scary that first night like just leaving them out there it was I mean it, it was definitely for somebody who had been breeding indoors and kind of like the traditional setup to go from taking your adults and and taking them from indoors when they're kind of like this constant state of spring to outdoors I was like ee! um but and so it was a little bit nerve-wracking but with his extensive knowledge and his background, I mean, I was really quite lucky um, that, you know, I had to put a little bit of, I had to put some faith into that, a lot of faith into that, that, um, you know, that, that he obviously knew what he was doing because he bred dragons for about 30 years. Um, so, and all of that was outdoors. He didn't do indoor at all. So most of his was down South with oh, all of it was actually down South. Um, but um but I wanted my dragons, I really, really had a desire for my dragons to have a more natural experience, for them to have larger enclosures, for them to have the ability to climb branches and have, a, you know, and, and have all these different things where they weren't just in a box. Like, I really, really wanted that for them. And so that was what really kind of pushed me to be like, okay, you know, I want to do this. I want to do this. Um, and so, yeah, so I've been, I've been very happy with it. I really love having my, um, my dragons outside. Uh, it works really, really well for me. It would not work in all circumstances at all. Uh, your microclimate is extremely important. You know, there's, there's minor distant differences. If I tried to do what I do here, 10 doors down, it wouldn't work. It absolutely wouldn't work. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of little things that go into it that oftentimes people don't really put a lot of thought into. So, um, yeah. In regards to microclimate, obviously people don't really understand the difference between humid and humidity and wet. How much of that do you feel is a factor in your success keeping outside in Florida? With, so with humidity, they do fine in high humidity. They really do. I mean, obviously central Florida, I have time, we have times where there's, you know, a lot of rain. We have a lot of times where it's just, you know, the humidity is high. I'm in Florida. Um, but, but other times it's a bit lower. Like today it was 50, around 50% was our humidity, but other times it's 80%, or, you know, hundred percent, whatever. As long as there's really like an, an outdoor situation and even indoors, ventilation is the big thing. It's really more about ventilation than humidity. Humidity becomes a problem if there's not proper ventilation. If there's proper ventilation, then it's not going to get, the environment's not going to get too wet. So that's the biggest thing. And, and people always talk about humidity and it kind of drives me bonkers because it's really more about, <laughs> about ventilation. So, and then as far as wet, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that I have to do to kind of mitigate um, when we have weeks of a lot, a lot of rain, then um, obviously we have to provide, um, you know, more dry space for the dragons uh, versus periods where we're going through a dry spell. So it just really depends on the season. We have uh, a variety of panels that I can, you know, screw into the tops to temporary put into the to temporary place on top of the enclosures, you know, a, a small portion of the enclosure, a larger portion of the enclosure, um, clear plastics, solid, you know, solid white, um, we use greenhouse plastics. So, I mean, we're constantly, constantly turning the dials. It's not just, you know, at this temperature outside, you do this. And at this, I mean, there's, there's so many things that go into play um, that, that really make that work. So. so as a seller then, this, this whole humidity thing, how much of that is the bane of your existence? What's that? Oh, um. <laughs> You mean as far as selling yeah. to, to clientele? I mean, do they feel it's a problem or do they get upset or? How hard is it like educating and saying no like, humidity? Oh, it's really, problem? it's really not difficult. I, I mean, I'll be honest, like I'm not a huge, I prefer like one-on-one -on -one with my clients. So most of my clientele is um, referral based, you know, they're looking for me specifically, they're searching me out specifically. Um, and I spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with my clients as far as answering questions. So I'm able to address those. I don't really get into, um, I I'm on social media, but you'll see, you'll almost never see me pop up in a group as far as speaking, because I'm not going to get into some sort of altercation with somebody over what they think they know versus what I've actually experienced with, you know, many, 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 many dragons, you know, so, um, but it's really not an issue. When I speak to somebody uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, they get it. They're like, oh, that makes sense. I understand. You know, you're able to have an actual conversation, whereas, you know, sometimes um, in some of these groups and on, you know, on social media and stuff, it's more of like this typing war that goes back and forth. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 one of them things where even in 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 Australia, like they have floods and then their burrows. Oh, they've for actually, sure. They've yeah. actually measured humidity. They have a rainy like season. Yeah, my girls yeah. will typically lay their eggs like um, when we run into area times of the year where it's really dry. They prefer waiting until after it rains. They'll lay their eggs after it rains. So you know, they're I, I've seen them out there in the rain, like literally laying eggs. <laughs> Yeah, this whole massive pain point for me is battling this whole humidity issue. And then to have someone that breeds in Florida, it's like, they just nip it in the bud now. Like, if they can live and breed in Florida, they're fine. They can, um, but see, here's the, th- here's the one thing that a lot of people don't understand is, is, again, I can't express enough, is the microclimate. So where you choose to breed them at. Like I said, down the street, I couldn't do it. Like, there are homes, five doors, or six, seven doors. We're on five acres. Um, so there's, like, homes that are, like, you know, six, seven homes down uh, that are now flooded. I'm high and dry. Makes a difference. Makes a big difference. Makes complete sense as well. Is it even sort of, like, south-facing, north-facing, things like that, how you, how you position the enclosures? Um, so my enclosures are actually, um, they're four by four right now for my adults, four by four, four foot by four foot by three foot tall. Um, so they're basically like a large box with multi levels, a subfloor. So the animals are really able to kind of choose, uh, where they go throughout the course of the day so that they can choose sun, choose shade. Um, but yes, I mean, we do take into account, um, you know, as far as positioning with the sun, uh, when they're, when they're laying eggs, for example, um, the girls, I know like early season, they always lay at the very front of the enclosure, um, during, uh, when we're about midway through season and it's not ridiculously hot yet, they're always laying in the middle, like, you know, towards the middle of the caging. Um, and then towards the, the heat, you know, when we're really getting into the heat, really hot 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 then the lay at the front which offers or excuse me the lay at the far back which offers them shade so they really they choose where they're going to lay they don't always go to the same spot it depends on the time of year we give them the ability to choose so they have choices they always have a choice i think that's the big paradigm of welfare it's always about choices and control for the animals so what percentage of your beardies are outside now versus inside um, so most of my adults are outside. There's a few that I have currently that will go into, they'll be cut, they'll go into my breeding program next year that are currently on a, like an indoor outdoor system. I roll them out, roll them back in. I like, I probably don't have to do that, but I like to do that to kind of acclimate them to, from going from indoor living to outdoor living. It makes me feel better anyway. You know, um, I feel like, and again, I feel like it doesn't mean I necessarily do, but I feel like they, um, adjust really well. They adjust a lot faster from going indoors to outdoors when I kind of give them that time to have, uh, you know, the, the basking in the sunlight, this and that, but they're still coming in in the evenings. So, um, so, but the vast majority, almost nearly all of my adults are outside about 90%. That's pretty cool. So you say these, you obviously say about the size of the enclosure and the subfloor, how have you designed the subfloor? Is that subfloor like, above ground still or is it actually below ground is in like okay so so on there's a portion of the enclosure that runs front to back um where they have the ability to dig down there's you know the sand which is basically just my backyard that we backfilled into the enclosure so um they can actually burrow down into that uh on the other side to the right there's actually a wood floor and they're able to 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 go under that as well. So where there's, there's basically, it's pretty much, um, there's a, there's a small amount of substrate there, but not a lot, but they're able to seek shelter there. So they, they have a lot of options. So, and then each enclosure has a variety of ramps. They have, you know, they can um, sit more vertically if they want, they can sit horizontally. Um, You know, there's different shelving at different heights. So they're able to utilize that at different times of the day. Uh, in the mornings, you know, obviously I, I see them pressed up against and, and, and heating up, then they kind of all choose their own spots as the, as the day progresses, like particularly during the summer, we really start heating the heat of the day. Um, then they go in and under hiding, they're hiding, they're not out at all. Um, they're in the subfloor, um, you know, they're in the shade 
And then as the day progresses and things start to cool down, they come back up and they start basking again. So it's that biphasic basking just like they do in the wild then? What's that? It's that biphasic basking like they do in the wild then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, it's, it's, it's amazing and annoying to someone who can only keep indoors and is trying so hard and spending so much money to try and replicate sunlight when uh, someone else has just got outdoors. <laughs> So with all this space and ability to exercise out outdoors and all this choice of control, have you noticed a difference in body condition of the ones that have come from indoors to outdoors? Yes, absolutely. So they're, um, so when I originally moved them outdoors and when I originally, you know, when I take dragons that were raised indoors and I start to, to do that transition and they move outdoors, um, it's a, it, they, they're, their muscles, um, they're, they're just, they're sturdier. They're just like, er, um, there's no flop. There's no, they're just, it's an entirely different animal. When they, when I pick them up, they grip more. They're not, you know, they're not just like, Bleh. <laughs> not that mine are like that, but there, but there is a difference. There's a difference, um, in, in what you see in the animal for sure, because they're using muscles that they wouldn't use if they were sitting in, you know, a box which I'm not, I'm not speaking against boxes. I mean, there's, there's, you know, you can do a lot of different things with them. You can do some absolutely fantastic things with them. I'm just saying in general, they're able to really get out and move and run and exercise. And, you know, I don't have, um, you know, my dragons are leaner uh, because of that. So. I think as well, because um, in the indoor boxes, their heat source is just sat in one place. Mm -hmm. So if they want to reach optimum temperature, they literally just have to sit there. Whilst there's in an enclosure like yourself, they have to follow the sun. So even if yeah, when they're oh, trying to sure. pass, they have to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And during the course of the year too, the position changes. So the position that they see changes just like during, you know, during different times of the day versus different times of the year, you start to see them shift and make changes in what they do, where they lay, where they bask, where they hide, where they, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's very interesting. I enjoy it. Sounds, sounds far better. So what sort of temperatures do you like, experience on a yearly cycle then? Um, so in the winter, we do here on occasion, we'll hit a low right around the freezing mark, right around 32 or so. Um, that's pretty short periods of time, though. Usually it's just one or two nights. Most of the time, our lows really don't get too below, too much below about mm, 42, 44. I mean, that's, you know, during a cold snap. But most of the time during the winter, our lows are going to be high 40s, low 50s, mid 50s, right around there. Uh, during the summers, we reach highs as high as, you know, 101, 102. This year was toasty. <laughs> um, so, you know, we definitely hit some some pretty good temps there. So it's a pretty wide swing. And the animals handle it just fine. Because obviously in the wild, they have these burrows and studies have gone down and have actually measured um, burrows over a, a, a long time frame. And these burrows supposedly sit consistently at 15 C, what's that, like 59 Fahrenheit, I believe. Um, and it's apparently that they don't even emerge from these burrows until air temperatures hit like 23 degrees, which is 73 Fahrenheit. I've got all the conversions here because I, I don't do Fahrenheit. Do you see any similarities to that sort of around them temperatures or is it? Um, I do. I do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now we obviously we, we uh, you know, it's managed here a little different. So we're using um, greenhouse plastics and and such. So we're using panels. So during the winter months, like I just switched over because it's starting to cool off now. I'm just switched over. I'm making the transition over to the clear plastics. So um, that's those panels have gone up now for I mean, obviously, you know, when we still have the rainy season going on, because right now we still do have some rain. So those are up right now. Um, and, and those will remain uh, in play until we come up on spring or actually until we start hitting it pretty, pretty full into spring. And then we'll switch over to I'll switch them over to the solid whites um, to provide additional shade um, so that they're not getting overheated. Um, and then we use six mil plastics throughout the winter as well. So how, you know, it's constantly. Um, so the six mil plastic will go completely over the enclosures when we're going through, you know, a cold snap. If it's going to get really low, if it, you know, if we're going to go into the 40s at night, uh, they're completely covered. The, the entire enclosure is covered up. Uh, in the morning, it's vented 
once we start, once they hit a certain temperature, once it's more about how the, how the enclosure feels like I'll peel it back a little bit and see what it feels like to me underneath there. And then I, you know, I kind of gauge, okay, it's time to go ahead and vent this. And then based on what's happening for the day, it's how much it's going to be vented. So if it's going to be really overcast and there's not going to be a lot of sun and, you know, the temps aren't going to get real high, you know, I'm only venting, you know, a little bit. Um, if the sun's going to be out, we're going to be, you know, high 60s, so on and so forth, then I peel it back more. So constantly kind of just turning the dials to make that work so that the animals are comfortable. So you've been and doing it for of, this long that it's like almost intuition at this point. Mm -hmm, yeah, I mean, obviously, when I when I first started, when I, when I first like like I said, this is my fourth season for me personally outdoors. And when I first started, I was like, okay, kind of getting the hang of it. Now I'm like, okay, I need to do this, need to do that, I need to switch over here, I need to switch over there. Which is why I tell people sometimes people think when they talk to me, you know, breeders, smaller breeders, up and coming breeders, they ask me about outdoors. Um, I always tell them I'm like, start part-time start um don't go at it full boat don't put them outside because like i'm not trying to be a jerk but you're going to fail <laughs> you have to understand how the climate works in your area you have to understand all the different you know when this happens you need to do this you you have to get a feeling you have to get that intuition going so that you know how to mitigate any situation that comes upon you because weather is chaotic nature is chaos so you have to be able to 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 make those changes and make them quickly um, so that your animals are thriving, you know, so that you're not putting them at risk or anything. So I always tell people it's not because I'm trying to be a jerk. I'm just like, go start part time, start part time, get the hang of it, see if it's even something that works for you. Make sure it's when you're home so that, you know, you can notice things and, you know, check on your animals frequently, this, that, and the other. Um, and then you can start to increase that over time. But it also depends on the area somebody lives in. A lot of places this won't work. It doesn't work and others it does. So, but I mean, I do encourage anybody that can to at least do some part-time outdoor keeping because um, natural sun is, is phenomenal for them and, and giving them the ability to get outside and climb and this and that, even if it's just for a couple months out of the year, you know, for a few hours a day is a big deal. It makes a difference. But make sure that your floors are secure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, because I see people that, that will go ahead and um, they'll build an enclosure and there's no, there's no floor. There's no, there's no, like we use a heavy gauge wire, uh, a vinyl coated wire on the bottom so that they can't dig out. So very important because obviously you don't want your dragon at your neighbor's house. Um, so yeah, that's very important. Making sure that you have a secure enclosure and then pay attention to your furniture placement. You know, is my animal able to seek shade at any time of day? Are they able to seek sun whenever they want? You know, do they have the ability to, to move so that they are, you know, all of their needs are met. So even like the placement of furniture, you're going in with this mindset of choice and control and how does this placement, this angle is placed in, offer a choice there and how does that interact with that and that is definitely the way to go about it. Yeah, and, and so when we first, um, when we build an enclosure, I mean, we'll, I'll set up the furniture one way and then I may tweak it and be like, oh, okay, well, you know, I noticed this, so I want to tweak it over here. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously you talk about like sunlight being this amazing thing. What difference in the animals have you noticed going from artificial sunlight so to speak to actual sunlight is there like an increased alertness or behavioral difference or um i mean as far as behavior is concerned you know some dragons just like just like so when i first move them outdoors um most of them are completely happy to be there they're they're fine there's no there's really not much of an acclimation process. And that's probably because I've kind of done the indoor outdoor thing for a while. So they're like, oh, okay, I got this, no problem. Um, on occasion, I'll have one that is a little bit skittish for a little while, just like if you were to put your animals outdoor for the day, you'll notice some of them will flare up and some of them don't. Uh, so same thing. Sometimes they'll kind of flare up a bit um, and, and it takes them a week or two to kind of acclimate to it and be like, all right, this is cool and I'm good. Um, I, I've had like, maybe two animals I can think of over the last four years that I've moved outside and it was like, nope, that's not for them. <laughs> they no. just didn't, it just wasn't their thing. They didn't like it. 
um, and you know, it didn't work out. So obviously you're having them outdoors. You talk, you're talking about like make sure they've got a floor to keep them in, but do you have the reverse problem of like of like pests and predators? Not. To, I mean, the way that we've designed the cages uh, is pretty much to keep you know anything that would be big and predatory out. Um, so I don't really have any problems with that. Um, the the enclosures are very secure. Um, the bottoms, like I said, are lined, stuff like that. So in this area, the biggest issue that we have. Um, are the potential issue that we would have that we've that 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 has been that we've taken care of you know uh, tried to prevent is uh toads so dragons and toads don't do very well together <laughs> is that because they're trying to eat the toads and getting intoxicated uh, yeah or? Mm -hmm. yeah they could they could potentially very much so be intoxicated by them so I lost one years ago when we first moved outdoors. There was one system that we used that involved lattice, and I lost one, and that was crushing to me. So, and it was a toad. Is it troublesome actually having to be able to collect these eggs in these outdoor enclosures? No, because I keep. I mean, for somebody that did so, the so part of this part of what makes this work is that I do this full time, so I'm always here. I'm constantly walking them, just kind of seeing how they're doing. Every couple of hours, I'll head outside. I'll see what's going on. I watch my girls tunnel. I know who's grabbed. I have basically a notes section in my phone that I walk through several times a week and check every single girl out, out there. And I feel every single girl for eggs. And I make a note in you know, a note section, uh, grab it, and where they're located, whether it's L1, S3, wherever they are. And I notate what girl is gravid and what stage they're at, you know, check back then, whatever. And so I know I can, I mean, within a day or two, I can tell you who's going to lay. So, um, so that I don't miss anything. And then, um, you know, keeping an eye on them and kind of seeing where, what girls and knowing the time of year. Okay. It's this time of year. So more than likely she's going to lay right in the middle. Okay. It's this time of year, more than likely she's going to lay in the back left corner. So you know, it makes it a lot simpler because my lay areas for the vast majority of my girls is about four foot long by about um, 18 or so inches wide. So it's a pretty good area. <laughs> um, that's a pretty big area to sort through, you know, to sift through if you're looking for eggs. But then you can also see signs, clear signs. Okay, somebody just laid in this area, like this is where the burrow was. And then I can follow the trail. I can tell the difference in the, um, in the sand and the dirt as far as where the tunnel goes. And I'm able to find them and locate them pretty easily. I can tell if they went back or if they went forward based on the way that the earth feels, which I know sounds weird, but after a little bit of practice, I was like, I got it. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> it is cool. So you talk about like rain and whatnot. Do you ever have times where the dragons actually seek rain, even though they've got cover on one side at all? Oh, for sure. Yeah, they run out on the ramp. They drink rain. I mean, it's obvious to me, like a lot of where they get their water. They like, which I'm sure you both are very well aware, but they really like water in motion. They don't really like stagnant water. They're not huge about drinking stagnant water. You know, that's like most dragons don't really want to drink out of a water bowl unless somebody's you know tapping it there's some sort of motion involved and they're like oh okay um but um but the rain they absolutely love the rain they run out in the rain i see them come out and run up the ramps and sit there and drink water so yeah for sure so and then at night the um you know as far as the dew they're taking in the dew too so that's one of the ways that my outdoor dragons stay hydrated as well um if we're in a really dry season during you know there's, there's certain times a year that I make sure that they have a water bowl at all times and there's other times a year that I kind of have a tendency to move them out and I'll clean them and put them right up on top of their enclosure so that as soon as I feel like I need to then I put it back in um, but if we're in a real rainy season then it just it's not necessary you know pop them out for a little bit that's so cool because I have this Obviously, I work in a, in a in a store here in the UK, and obviously, I'm going around looking after the bit of dragons. And I make a point of, as I spray like all the Caledonian geckos and whatnot, I will also spray a bit of dragons for them to drink droplets off the, their nose and whatnot, and on the plants. And you always get people like, "What are you doing? You don't know what you're doing. It's a bit of dragon. You can't spray it." And it's just like, no, because this is what they do: dew, rain, all of the above. 
Yeah, I feel like, so for me indoors, what I do is I have a tendency like for my babies, I keep their enclosures like ridiculously clean because I'm really OCD about that. And so I have an area of each enclosure that I actually missed the enclosure wall itself, um, which I use, you know, a tub system for the most part, like a 56 quart tub system. Um, and then the water runs down that wall and them seeing the water run down, they run over and lap up the water. So that's one of the ways that I use as kind of a, that's one of several methods that I use indoors um, for keeping the dragons hydrated. And then the ones that want to go over and drink can, and then, you know what I'm saying? So that works out really well for me um, versus spraying them directly. I don't like to spray them directly. That's my preference. Um, I feel like the animals do better because I'm giving them a choice rather than like, hey, let me blast you with some water. <laughs> um, as I just go ahead and, and spray the sidewall. So I found that works really, really well. If your enclosures are clean. Yeah, so it's, sometimes it's common sense. So like if you're normally going to spray a rock and there's like feces on it, maybe don't spray the rock to encourage them to drink from that. Yeah, but, oh yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Or I'll have like a little dish that I'll spray the water directly into. Like I keep little, um, the mason jar lids in there because those are easy to clean, the plastic ones. Um, or a variety of little bowls or whatever. So I've used a number of different ones during the years. Um, you know, everybody has their preference, but, um, but spraying directly into that little bowl and then seeing the water, then that a lot of times they'll jump down and run to drink rather than just, you know, filling up the little bowl and bringing it back. Um, they have a tendency to run over and drink more if you're actually actively spraying the bowl. I've also tried like running like an airline, do you like a fish tank airline, like an airstone, and leaving that in the water bowl so it's constantly bubbling. And I yes, think that's yeah, quite sure. effective as well. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, they they really are drawn. That's why when you like you know when somebody offers them a bath or something, you know, having them. Um, taking, having like an adult, for example, in the shower versus putting them in the tub when, when, you know, like as far as like a pet keeper, um, when a pet keeper puts a dragon in the tub, they oftentimes uh, won't actually drink unless the water, unless the, the, the pet owner actually has the water running, you know, when the water's on and it's trickling because that's generating motion. And so they're really drawn to that. Whereas if the water is stagnant and just not move in motion, they're just like, eh. <laughs> I wonder if that's a difference because obviously I don't tend to bathe with dragons unless they've like smeared feces all over themselves and I actually want to just rinse them off because obviously it causes them to defecate early and whatnot. I wonder how much of that whether they wouldn't defecate if they were in like a shower per se rather than being like surrounded with warm water. Oh no, they'll still do that. <laughs> oh really? I mean, if they're in the shower, oh yeah. <laughs> so it's weird because some dragons, it literally all it takes is like setting them down. Because I, when I kept indoors, I found that actually for my adults, I preferred putting them in the shower to the bath, like running the shower water, um, rather than putting them in a bath. So um, I would run the shower, but it's the same thing. Some dragons instinctively, just literally, as soon as the the, the shower comes on, it's the, the motion starts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could tell, you could tell it's coming, um, you know, but uh, anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah, the, the water in motion is, they, they definitely. Odd question for you then. If you, if you do like the slow acclimation, if you have them inside first, if one of them is like that and you take them outside, do they react that way to rain or? Um... I think most of what I see outside is the same thing that I do in, indoors, which is, you know, you hit that certain point of the day or in the, in the morning with their basking point where they sit, they heat, they, uh, they hit a certain temp. And then that is what typically um, is when they eliminate. So a lot of my babies, for example, indoors have a tendency, it's like a poo-a-thon right around 11 a.m., it's just like, boom, <laughs> you know, like almost all the way across the house. I mean, most of it occurs like right around 11 a.m. It's like, oh, great. It's poo time. Um, and so outdoors is kind of the same thing. I notice once they hit, you know, basically an operating temp, then that's when they defecate. That's when they go. To be honest, I, but I don't know if rain actually would cause, you know, I don't know about that as far as outdoors. Perhaps it's just the temperature of the water that obviously lists it as well. So in the wild, obviously they have like a, like a yearly cycle. Obviously they, they'll brumate, and in the spring they'll build, build their escape burrows. And in the summer, because the temp air temperatures and whatnot are high enough, all of the um, the snakes and that 
are active and they tend to sleep in trees and become more arboreal than they usually are. Do you find you find them higher up in the enclosures during the summertime? So during the summer here, what I actually notice is during the hottest part of the day, I actually see them go into the subfloor. They actually seek um, shelter down below. So that's when they have it. That's that's what they do here for the most part. So I will see them up, but for the most, or or they'll seek, um, they'll sit up on the top level, but under the shade panel. Like if they were in a tree covered by leaves. Right, right, exactly, exactly. They're looking for shade is what they're looking for. Whether they find it higher up or down below, you know, it's wherever they can find it that they're comfortable. So, you know, like I said, I mean, it'll be other, it'll be either under the shade panel or they'll be under the subfloor. Do you find they sleep in any particular space in the summer or they just, they all do their individual things? Yeah, they, they kind of like wherever they're at, they just kind of like dump out, just like indoors, you know, <laughs> people always tell, <laughs> clients always send me texts, oh my God, my dragon's falling asleep in this position. I'm like, yeah, cause it's lights out. Wherever they are, it lights out. They just have a tendency to go boom. So <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Same, same outdoors. <laughs> Notice no difference outdoors, same thing. <laughs> So obviously at the moment we've got you've got hurricanes around you and whatnot. How do stormy weather? How does that affect your process? So it depends on uh, how severe the storm is. <laughs> um, obviously the hurricanes, it's kind of like you know we're watching the forecast, we're seeing where the storm is going because you have to keep in mind you have to be prepared to pull and bring everybody in. Okay, but anytime you pull. Doing something can generate stress. Doing nothing can generate stress. So you have to figure out what generates the least amount of stress for the animal. If it's going to be just like a rainstorm, a typical rainstorm, then they're left outdoors. So because, again, they have all the panels. They have the ability to get out of the rain. They don't have to sit in the rain if they don't want to. They have a choice. There's areas of the enclosures that will stay bone dry and others that, you know, won't. And so they have options. Um, you know, if it's determined that the weather is at risk of being too severe, then I'm prepared to pull them all. So, and bring everybody in, but I get them right back out as soon as I can, you know, right after the event is over. Cause obviously that's a stress event for them. So you do have like spare enclosures inside for all the ones that are outside or you just tub them up for, for like the night and then take them out when the storm's over. I have good sized tubs that I use. So that I use to, to bring them indoors. I mean, if it's a, if it's a period of like, usually it's less than 24 hours, it's like 12 hours, you know, whatever it's an overnight type thing, whatever. Um, that would be no difference than you put them in, you know, them being shipped somewhere or, you know, a rainy day where they're not going to read optimal temps. People are like, Oh my God, they have to have heat at all times. No, they don't. <laughs> you know, if it's raining or whatever, they just kind of go dormant. They don't eat. You don't feed them. You don't feed them. You don't mess with them. Um, but they do just fine. And that's one thing that people have a tendency. Sometimes over caring is a thing. Um, and people think that they got to do too much. So um, if I do have to run a poll, they're all secure. Uh, they just kind of take a nap. And then when they wake back up, then they go, you know, I let them get back up to optimate, uh, operating temp and then, you know, back to normal. We had this conversation today, actually, didn't we, Ellie, where there's people on groups that were like, oh, my God, I'm going to be with that power for 24 hours. What do I do? What do I do? I was like, nothing. Just leave it. Yeah, yeah. I actually. Yeah. Yeah. I actually made a post about that on my business pages on social on Facebook and Instagram um, because I didn't know if I was going to lose power and if I was going to lose Internet service. And so I have a lot of people during storms, like everybody in Florida is sending me a text. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So I just went ahead and made an announcement like this is what you need to do, Um, you know, that a healthy baby dragon can go several days without heat. Just don't feed. Don't feed. Don't mess with it. Just leave it alone and it'll be fine. It'll just sleep. Um, you know, same thing adults, although not ideal, they can go weeks, you know, I mean, unless they're information, obviously they're going to go weeks, but, um, if they're not information, you know, no, do I want them sitting there for weeks without power? No, but can they? Yes, they can just don't feed them. You know, you don't want food rotting in their gut. It's, you know, things like that, that you need to think about. I think it was literally this week we were in a reptile shop and there was, Um, a person there wanting advice because they had their bulb on 24 7 and he was like I need a darker bulb because it's too bright for him at night and everyone was like pardon 
because they have the built in their head a desert animal it literally cannot get cold when they don't think about that natural daytime's really warm but nighttime is really cold and they actually need that difference to um for their mm. immune system right. and um, it was a bit like oh bless it no turn <laughs> it off <laughs> yeah i i run into that very a lot people will you know a lot of people, even if they don't purchase from me, will reach out to me, help, you know, I don't know what to do. My dragon's doing this. And, and so I always ask, like, there's a bullet set of questions that I go through to determine where they are um, as far as their husbandry and what they're doing, what they're not. And a lot of times I'm able to target, okay, this is what it is. And this is what you need to do to change it. I mean, it just, it's like autopilot for me, I guess. And that's a common thing is, is finding out that they're, they're burning a light 24 seven, or they have, you know, a red light on and you're just like, no, no. <laughs> get that thing off <laughs> let's talk about this <laughs> and so I you know I spend the time with them to go through the discussion of you know what the animal you know need what they you know what kind of cycle they really need for for optimal health so and that's another reason why I think my adults do so well outdoors is like I said before touch based on before nature is chaos and you know that helps their immune system that actually helps their immune system to be challenged if a lab rat goes into general population, what happens? Because they're in this stagnant, sterile environment. What happens to a lab right? They die, you know? Whereas a dragon that is given some challenges with a very diet, you know, lighting, heat, you know, stressor, various stressors, um, then their immune system is working. Their immune system is challenged and they're able to overcome these things. And that makes for a stronger animal. It's like so, kids coming out of the pandemic, you know, and getting every cold underneath the sun because they haven't been in school and then everybody's getting sick. Same thing. Yeah, that was me. I got <laughs> absolutely smashed with every cold one after another. That was me. <laughs> and then there was me. I was the key worker throughout it. So I literally was absolutely fine. <laughs> and, and that's my point. I mean, really, I mean, that is if you think about it. An animal that is given like little micro challenges here and here, okay, a little bit cooler temp, a little bit hotter temp, a little bit less, you know, a little drier, a little wetter, you know, they go through all these different things. I'm eating at seven o'clock instead of five, you know, not seven, but you know what I mean? Like different times and it's kind of, you know, you're giving them, you're giving their body the, the ability to work, you know, the immune system, the ability to work, um, you know, you use it or lose it. Um, and I think that's a lot of times why we see some of the problems that we do, particularly with these large mass breeding facilities, is that everything is just perfect temps all the time, perfect spring, this, that, and the other. And then as soon as the animal leaves and the animal is challenged, then the animal dies because it's had no, it's had nothing to challenge its immune system at all. It's just been like stagnant. Do you feel we can keep them too sterile then? Um, I think that years ago I kept mine too sterile. I think I did, you know, I mean, I didn't keep them. I, I have, I, I believe like some of the quats and things like that. I think that there's a time and a place for them, but I think that the regular use of them all the time is a bad idea. So I don't use them all the time at all. Um, because I feel like they really, really are, are creating super bugs. It's kind of like, you know, you constantly getting antibiotics, a child getting antibiotics over and over and over and over again, what happens all of a sudden they become ineffective and the bugs that they get are, are even more, you know, have the ability to knock them out even further. So uh, to generate a problem. So, you know, as we do stronger and stronger chemicals and as you use stronger and stronger drugs, you know, then you're ending up with these really resistant super bugs. I mean, some of the mass breeding facilities have huge problems with these super bugs, I mean, bad. Um, and one way to avoid that is, you know, be clean, be clean, but don't be sterile because the animal it was not designed to live in a sterile environment. Just literally do some research, for example, on lab rats. You know, lab rats are in a sterile environment. As soon as they leave that sterile environment, they die. They can't live. Um, because their immune system gets challenged and their immune system doesn't know what to do with it. It's had no practice. So that, that's a problem. And that's something that more people, I think, need to kind of take that into consideration other than like, oh, my clothes are super clean because I use this and I use it every day. And I, and I think that that really is doing the animal a disservice. That reminds me of uh, the, the, the university that both I and Eddie went to. They've got this huge 
bit of dragon enclosure in the corner of a room. It's got this really deep clay sand level of sand. Um, and I said, I, I asked them the question of how often are you like taking that all out? Because the stereotype is, you know, do a full clean once a month, disinfect the enclosure and I put fresh sand in or fresh bedding in. Um, and they said, we don't change it. Because like, they, they've they also got the labs done literally down the corridor and they have students for their sessions you know swabbing sand at different depth and they've cultured it and there's not any concern of what bacteria or what's in there and they don't do it so i've also kicked mine on play sand and i have literally not changed it since january and it, it's fine but that would be absolutely like blasphemy to most bit of dragon keepers Yes, absolutely. But I mean, with that, I think that there's, um, there's balance in everything. So, you know, how large is the enclosure? Um, you know, does the animal have options to get off the ground? What kind of diet are you feeding it? Is the animal being overfed? You know, are there microorganisms in the sand or is it completely sterile? You know, is it somewhat bioactive or is it not? I mean, there's all these different things that you have to take into account because if I told somebody, oh, you can use sand and you can use it throughout the enclosure and you never have to change it it would not be good, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if the general pet keeper. So it depends on the level of experience that the individual has as far as where I go with, this is what I recommend for you. And I think it needs to be tailored based on somebody's experience or their understanding of the animal. If they don't have a, a clear understanding, then, then I think that that sand is kind of, could be, you know, very detrimental. For example, you know, sand, if, um, you know, if they're not providing the proper uh, vitamin routine, uh, they're going to, the impaction is possible. If the temps aren't proper, then impaction is definitely possible. So if you know what you're doing and you have the experience and uh, then sand is great and there's no issue at all. So that's why I get kind of a little frustrated with people saying sand, no sand, sand, no sand. It's more about experience, no experience. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 one of the things where it's it's like low vitamin D from like poor UV that that causes an inability inability for peristalsis to occur to even remove blockages. There's things like uh, low heat obviously stops them from actually moving things along. There's dehydration causing low lubrication of organs, so these can get blocked. So you almost have to get something wrong to cause to occur it's, again that's experience isn't it i always have this problem at work as well where i say to someone uh, they'll come in and be like why are you selling sand are you, that's that's not allowed <laughs> and i'll be like well do you feed they're like oh but, but it's a risk i'm like well do you feed your bugs and they're like yeah well I was like, why that's a risk because chitin in itself if you get the animal to that stage where impaction is a risk in the first place even feeding them bugs is a risk for impaction so it's just about education and get people to the stage where they actually know how to look after the animal first. Exactly, exactly. So going on about diet then, what sort of diet are you providing? Obviously you're cohabiting different sexes and obviously different sexes have different ratios or are you just providing the same diet for the same sexes? Um, so, I mean, the enclosures are large, so I have a tendency to kind of like drop food in different areas for them based on where various animals are. So, you know, I, I mean, it, I really don't have an issue with that. Um, during breeding season, then I'm offering, um, I, I actually offer kind of a blend of bugs. Uh, so I'll mix up mealworms, black soldier fly larvae, and supers. And the ratio that I use depends on the time of year and where I am in the breeding season. So if I'm in the middle of the breeding season, then I'm using more supers. If I'm in heading into off season, like I am now, I use next to no supers, you know, very few to just, you know, just a couple. Um, so it just kind of depends on the time of year. Um, I vary that quite a bit. And then greens, um, I off, I Honestly, I mean, I live on five acres. I don't use pesticides at all. Um, so I have a lot of weeds that grow naturally in my yard that have antimicrobial, anti, you know, antibacterial, antiviral uh, properties to them. And I use those for greens uh, in rotation with other things. And that goes, I mean, that's, that's huge. That's huge. I mean, number one, most importantly, it helps to keep um, any possible, um, you know, parasite infestation, like under control. Um, and then secondly, it's, um, you know, it's less expensive for me. It reduces my costs. So, but it's, you know, it's a more natural and they're getting 
they're getting so when they're eating great that when they're eating weeds that I've picked, for example, then they're getting like some of the some of the calcium that would naturally occur in the soil and stuff that they wouldn't get in a store bought, you know, something that was bought at the store and, you know, packaged and washed and this, that and the other. So. I was waiting for you to say something, Ellie. I thought you were going to say that. Oh, though, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do the exact same thing where we, we, we literally go on weed walks and pick huge amounts yeah, of weeds. Yeah, see, and... that's great. But I have some people here that'll be like, what? You can't do that. You can't do that. I'm like, have you ever see, have you ever noticed how many times a year they have recalls on romaine and this, that, and the other? Think about it. Like, think about the environment that your food is being cultivated. Think about the amount of pesticides in use. And even if you are going organic, think about that. I mean, there's a lot of recalls and there's, you know, people think, oh, if it comes from the grocery store, then it's clean. And if you get it from your yard, it's dirty. It's like, no, <laughs> hmm. that's not the way it works. I mean, obviously if somebody lives, um, you know, in a neighborhood and they're on quarter acre, you know, and they're on zero lot lines, you know, you're not going to use your, you know, the weeds in your yard because there's going to be spraying involved. There's going to be risks associated with that. But for me and my particular sort of set of circumstances, it works really well. Um, you know, if I have a dragon that is, you know, displaying some signs of, you know, maybe they've picked up pinworms or, you know, their coccidy level is rising a little bit or something like that, then I will go ahead and, and give them a few days of like extra weeds rather than giving them bugs. And it, it, it clears up. I mean, it's like nature provides everything, right? That's like natural medicine. It's not coming in a bottle, pharmaceutical, um, and I'm not building up super, bug, I'm not creating super bugs or, you know, having, um, you know, drug resistant problem. Well, that's exactly how a bearded dragon would cope in the wild. If it felt like it had a heavy burden, they mm -hmm. self medicate and they will go and find those weeds. So exactly. you're just helping them. <laughs> exactly. I'm just giving them that opportunity and I'm giving them that, hey, here's this. And they will go right for it, just like a dog or a cat. You know, if you have a, you know, anybody that has dogs or cats, they notice they eat grass and this, that, and the other when they have various ailments to try to clear that. You know, they're trying, they, they know what to instinctively do. So I'm just providing it for them. Um, and that is huge. That's huge. So, well, what we do is. There's an app called the tortoise table .org, um, that is got like a traffic light diet system for tortoises. So it's like, well, it includes weeds as well. So it's like green is like safe to feed every day. Amber is like your moder in moderation thing. And it goes into like gorgogens or if it's sugar and whatnot. And then red's toxic. But there's also an app called picture this for iPhone and you can take pictures of weeds and it identifies it. So what we do is we take pictures of weeds, identify it, then go into that, see whether we can feed it. And in that way, I don't even know what I feed my bit of dragon. I do, but I mean, there isn't a structure because it's whatever I found at the final the day sort of thing. So that's the way that we do it. Um, I don't know if, if that's a UK website or not, but... I, I use an app as well to, you know, so that I can identify various weeds to make sure that they're not toxic. Um, so, and over time, I mean, I've been on this property now for like, for, like I said, about four years. So I've learned what's here that I can feed and what I can't feed. Yeah. We, we, we got to a point where we're like oh it's that we just see it down the path and things like that i feel like going out and like picking weeds activates some sort of part in your brain that's like foraging as well it's a bit it does something weird to you doesn't it i, I like, feel like it i'm on mean, easter again yeah <laughs> i'm like wow. i like it I'm, yeah i'm like okay i'm going out to pick weeds <laughs> so but so it's funny i get deliveries and people are doing like what is she doing <laughs> Yeah, FedEx shows up, I'm out weeds, in the yard yeah. picking weeds and <laughs> putting them in a tub. <laughs> and everyone gives you like a really weird look as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so obviously being outside, obviously you're gonna have like insects crawling in and out. So do you obviously they I wonder if you've seen it. I'd imagine they definitely are eating wild bugs, but have you obviously seen them eating wild bugs and how does that play into the wood roaches they eat the wood roaches we we get wood roaches in there in the enclosures so if they see one scoot across they're like Doop. <laughs> they'll make a dart for it i used to worry about it um I'm not gonna lie at the beginning i was just like oh my god um but i don't worry about it because my animals are kept um as they should be and their immune systems work and i provide them with all the tools to be able to deal with anything that they may happen to run across you know if there is um, you know, a parasite or anything like that. And it's really pretty much, I mean, it's been not, I mean, it's, I just don't worry about it anymore. I've learned, I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I look in their enclosures and they have beautiful, you know, there's their, their stools are well-formed and everything else. And I'm like, we're good. So it's really kind of a, it's not 
It's not something that I concern myself with anymore. Um, and if anybody has ever been to some of these uh, large um, production facilities for bugs, um, I would, I'm a little bit more leery of that than I am what's in my backyard, to be honest with you. I think we've literally had discussions about this where um, it's in the same case of like factory farming for animals. They are kept really close confinement where when they're defecating, one's got infected with worms, mm -hmm. they're all sat there infected. So you're actually, if you're being careful, more likely to have it from actual farmed foods than you are. From right. Wild and, worms. And, and typically the only time that you see like um, problems with like um, parasite infestation or something in large breeding facilities that are outdoors, uh, we won't go there with names or anything, but like large facilities, um, then they're overcrowded. The animals are really overcrowded and they're stressed and they're not in an ideal situation. You know, they're not being kept, you know, as, as I would keep them. So their stress level is already high. Their immune systems really aren't going to be optimal. They're not, you know, so, so problems are going to result from that. So um, talking about communal living and things like that. So it's a big thing in the hobby. No, no, beardies have to be solo. Do you find that um, they actually have, you've seen any squabbles you see, or do they live quite harmoniously? Um, because my enclosures are so large and because it's not just about being four foot by four foot, but it's also three foot tall. Mm -hmm. So, and there's multiple levels and there's multiple places for everybody to go and bask and this and that, then I've kind of, you know, that really isn't an issue. The only issue that I see on occasion is when I have an alpha female and she usually goes after. So all of my closures are either 1.1, 1.2 or 0.2. And it just depends on, um, it just, it, it just depends on my, pro, you know, my breeding program, what I'm, who's being paired up with whom, who gets, you know, stuff like that. Um, so if I have a real alpha female that's just intolerant of other, it's always the girls, uh, that's intolerant of another, it is, uh, of another female, then she gets housed with the male by herself, you know, or she'll be housed by herself and the male will rotate in and out. Um, if, if the male is being, you know, is also being, uh, paired to another female, then I'll just rotate them. So it's, it's generally only I I've seen, I've had it happen a couple of times, but I know what to watch for. I know what the signs of aggression are. You know, sometimes you have this initial like little squabble phase when you first introduce them, but they're working, you got to give them an opportunity to work it out. Initially, I was like, eh. I, I was a little bit hesitant to allow them to work it out. And then I learned over time, oh, they, they work this out. Um, but if they don't work it out, if you see some signs of like, you know, like really, really just kind of like the side swiping and just like, you know, running up and just darting and, um, you know, th there's certain point, you know, biting at the tail and, you know, whatever, then I'm like, okay, that's it. You're getting yanked. Um, and then I just, you know, modify my plan. So I have plenty of enclosures here where I'm able to, um, you know, make those adjustments. It's not like anybody has to be forced to be together. There's, uh, there's always, I always have a solution as far as being able to move things, move animals around so that they're comfortable and not stressed. Yeah. So um, when you're picking your pairings, are you picking purely because you have um, like a project in mind or are you looking for other things as well as just the looks? Um. So like, do you pick ones that do better, give you better clutches, have better babies? Oh, like better? okay. Yeah. So, I mean, really I'm looking for a whole list of things. So things mm -hmm. that I'm looking for in my animals is like, I like, I prefer to keep back and from bloodlines that have like, you know, obviously hundred percent hatch rate, um, all the babies when they hatch out or even in size, they have, you know, relatively even growth rate. I mean, you're always going to have a couple that are, you know, chug ahead and a little couple that, just, but for the most part they all kind of, kind of keep in track of each other. Um, so, um, I look for a variety of things like that. Um, you know, the confirmation of the animal you know, how do they look? Um, how do they feel? You know, are they really stubby? Do they have crunkled toes over by under by, you know, all that stuff. So in addition to obviously, okay, this one's head for trans, this one's head for this, mm -hmm. this one's head for zero, whatever. Um, so that goes to play too. So it's like, a, it's a big formula. 
um, as far as why I decide to put certain pairs together. It's not just, oh, this or this. It's just like the whole, the whole thing. To me, what the most important thing is um, selecting animals, you know, holding back animals from pairings that I've done that, again, have had like, you know, 100%, ha you know, uh, you know, really, really high hatch rates. Uh, the, the babies are large, they have an even growth rate, they're not real staggered, things like that. Um, so that's my number one. Uh, what would you say is the number one mistake or the biggest mistake you see keepers making with diet? Um, for pet keepers, as far as diet, I think it's not using a multivitamin. Uh, I'll be honest with you, like when they get set up and they, you know, you're giving them the list of things to do, they think so much about calcium. And then you go back and you're like, did you get the multivitamin? You know, when are you giving the multivitamin? And they're like, oh, they forget the multivitamin. And that can lead to a whole, you know, not having the Bs, the As. I mean, that leads to eye issues, neuro issues, this, that, and the other. So, I mean, that's really, I think that's, that's definitely probably at the top of the list. <laughs> Uh, is, is people not, because it's not something that you, it's not something that they offer every day. So they're like, Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I forgot. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I forgot. And before you know it, the bottle's sitting behind, it's got dust on it and they're forgetting to use it period. And I think that that's, you know, that's, that's a problem. So what supplements do you use then? Um, I honestly use several different brands. I don't have like a, okay, this is the only brand I use because I think that every brand has maybe a little too much of this or a little too little of that or whatever. So by rotating it, then I'm able to kind of hopefully eliminate that and kind of give a little bit more balance. Just like I offer a variety of foods. I believe in offering a variety of multivitamins and calcium. So I use, you know, several different brands. I use Rapacia, uh, Rapashi, Arcadia, um, I use Necton, um, I use Zumed, so RepCal. See, everyone looks sometimes. at me like I'm crazy when, because my multivitamin shelf is a collection and I've got like loads of different brands and everyone's like, but you only need one. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no I you mean, don't. I, yeah, because I just feel like, you know, I mean, there's some brands that are a little heavier on the vitamin D than others. Mm -hmm. There's some brands that are a little higher, higher on the A. There's, you know what I'm saying? So I just, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of like casting a wider net to get, you know, to get everything covered if I'm offering variety in that. And then I use, I also use like the, which they need to do breeder bags. So I use like the dragon fuel and then I make my own mix that I do that I add to like my greens, you know, um, with, with a lot of the similar things that's in the dragon fuel. So, um, so I do that as well. I always tell, I, um, when you work in a shop, you're dealing with people who are obviously getting something for the first time and it's so, so easy to like overwhelm them. So I like the Arcadia route because Joe, the earth pro A, Everything in there is a precursor to something. So they can feed that as much as they want. Because it's either a precursor or it's water soluble. So in theory, they cannot overdose. So I say to them, mix the Earth Pro A with the calcium MG, which gives a bit of magnesium in there. But all of that then is precursors or water soluble. You can do that every single time. You don't have to worry about that. And then once a week, give them up with it. And I try to simplify it all the way down. Because it's such a good product that it's all done in a way that is... In my view, perfect. I did my thesis on gut loading, and I came to some the same conclusion for what I would design. That's what Arcadia already made, even though I didn't already know that. So I like that it exists. That then people don't even need to think about it. I say this is this. Just do that, and then that. And I do. I do that, and then I do once a month Nutribol. I might with it because that is a really potent. Um, is a really potent might with it, but I would do it once a month just to variety like you say very in a variety right yeah i love the arc i love arcadia i really do they need breeder bags <laughs> so because when i order calcium i order calcium <laughs> you <know what> i order <laughs> so have you seen you know, like i said we have 14 different species here so it's not just the dragons i'm feeding it's you know a lot of different species but have you seen what's coming up from arcadia now it's the uh the tortoise 56 thing where they've got like fields in Europe with loads of different weeds and they've like chopped it all down, harvested it and compressed it into little bricks and then you just add water and it hydrates like co like, like cocoa fiber, like how you would hydrate that. Like, but it's like 56 different species of weeds in it. It's for tortoises, but I'm planning on testing it with a bit of dragons. Yeah, definitely. You'll have to let me know. 
Yeah, I mean, it's coming out in the UK this week. I mean, John messaged me the other day, so it should be out next week, but I'm looking to test that as well. That should be fun. Availability of their products is a little bit more of a problem in the States. It's harder to, to get. Um, a lot of places don't carry it. A lot of times they're out of stock. So, I mean, there's definitely the availability issue. And again, if they're listening, breeder bags would be awesome. Because I think a lot more breeders would utilize, they would use their, um, their products if they actually, you know, had, you know, I mean, I go through a lot of multivitamins and calcium and so on. I'll text so him. It's, it's text very, him it's very expensive to, you know, <laughs> to just do the. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. That makes bags. sense. Yeah, yeah, it's not very cost effective. I do it anyway because I love their product, but it's not very cost effective. Yeah, we'll let him know. So obviously, oh, you've already asked that, Ellie. Cohabitation. You're well ahead of me. <laughs> So do you observe much social behaviour? Obviously, they do have social behaviour that they've evolved to have. So how much of that do you see? Do you feel like there's another side to be the dragons that is never brought out when kept singly? Or do they simply just, like, tolerate each other when they're doing well? No, I mean, they're definitely... Um, they're So when I have, for example, three dragons together, you know, a male, two females, I mean, there's definitely a hierarchy where it's understood who, you know, who ranks where. Um but, um, you know, I don't know. I, we, <laughs> um, getting myself stuck on this one. Do you see a lot of head bobbing and arm waving and things like that? Not, not really. I mean, I don't, not a whole lot. I mean, you see some of it, you see sometimes, you know, they're, but I mean, they, they really coexist pretty well together. Um, the way that I have them set up like I said, the only thing that I ever have really almost, it's always a female. It's a, it's an alpha female. Alpha females can be completely intolerant of any other female and intolerant to a male unless he's very dominant or she's cycling. So, you know, you kind of have to pair that up accordingly. Like my alpha females, um, you know, I have to use a very, you know, a male that really kind of lets her know, like, <laughs> you know, we need to not do this and so they're able to find balance that way so do you know if there's any super females in 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 the hobby or is it all just in australia what's that do you know if there's any super females in, in like the hobby or are they all in australia still um i'm not aware so there is like in our in the wild ones at least i talked to you know, dr jonathan howard beardy vet I talk to him quite a bit. They have super females where there's some females that will be uh, a female, but they'll have the G the chromosomes of a male, and they'll be like larger and hyper aggressive and right. things so, like that. Yeah, so I've that's... seen. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, no, I've read um, quite a bit about that. But I mean, as far as like if there's been any type of studies done or anything like that, as far as in captive populations, I don't think so. I'd imagine we started with quite a small captive founder there anyway, so probably unlikely. So obviously, obviously in the wild, um, it's funny because everyone's so against cohabitation, obviously because it's above all the accidents that have occurred because of forced approximation. But in the wild, they, they it, uh, really that was literally finding males and females in like pairs. So it's very, it's very strange dichotomy of like what may be actually a wild thing versus what people are it's almost like this dogma that you can't it's very strange yeah so i've noticed over the years i've had a couple of and people are like oh it's just your imagination this that and the other i'm like okay whatever um but i've had some pairs over the years like i've had a few males over the years um, that would only breed one female. Like he would breed, it was like they were paired. It was, they, that was, that was his girl. And I would introduce him to other girls and nothing would happen. Um, so, I mean, I've had it happen a couple of times, who's to say, but like I had a pair, <laughs> one of them's name was Boo and one of them was Buki. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Boo only ever bred Buki. He never wanted another female. I paired him with other females and he never bred them yet I put the females in with other males and they paired up the girls laid. I mean, I was able, you know, I was able to produce um, babies from that female, but Boo wanted nothing to do with any other girl other than Buki. Um, so I've had that happen a couple of times over the years. 
I've also had um, um, dragons that I've cohabbed uh, even before I started keeping outdoors. I had a couple um, that I kept together. Um, and, you know, most of the time when I was breeding indoors, my males were housed separately. My females a lot of times were housed separately, or I maybe had two females in an enclosure if they were like my large, like my larger enclosures, my fours or five foots, I would have two girls in there. Um, but I, I did have a few times where like I, you know, I paired the male and the female and they got along so well and they just seemed to I don't know. And I've, I've literally separated them. And it was almost like they went through a state of depression, which whether that happened or not, I don't know, you know. Um, but I, I think a lot of times we, we draw these lines where we're like, okay, well, it's an animal there, you know, it's a bearded dragon, therefore this, that and the other, and that's it, there's no variability. And I think that's wrong to think that way. And everybody's, everybody has a tendency to say, oh, well, you know, um, the species does this, but, but you see variations of that. So drawing that hard line, I think is a bad idea. And I think it's, you know, short-sighted of us to, to do that. I don't, I think it just depends on the individual animal. I think um, it's just like with feeding, everybody's like, well, what do you feed? Like, how much do you feed? Well, it depends on the animal. Some animals have a higher metabolic rate than others. You know, some, some of my girls, um, you know, when they have, once they've laid eggs, once they've produced, their metabolic rate slows a little bit, you know, and they're a little bit more um, prone to obesity than others are. So you have to tailor it for each individual animal. And again, drawing that line and saying, you have to do this and it's this, and this is the formula is, I think that's, a, that's not, not, the, not the way that we should be doing things. Well, there was one of the old Judith Adams papers that actually, where they put wild bearded dragons, brought them into these big pits, and there were males that would pick a female and just stick to that female. So I definitely, you definitely aren't making that up because that's happened in like, like seventies and eighties papers and stuff. So that is definitely a thing. Yeah, I don't see it too often, but I definitely see it on occasion. I'm just like, okay, this is this is a pair, and this is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess with that. They they know what they're doing. I'm gonna leave them together. <laughs> So, in terms of diet, I feel like very much the same. It's it's almost to say like you wing it, but you don't wing it. It's just like you feel it, and it's very very hard. You can't just say that to begin. They when you're first starting out, you want like a regiment. You're like I do this and then this and then this and then this and then to say someone say to you like figure out, let's just like feel it. They're like, what does that even mean? Like, <laughs> and it's like when so in, in addition, it's like when somebody asks me, well, how many bugs do you feed a baby? Well, it depends on the baby. It depends what size is the baby, what size is the bugs. That's why making a care sheet for a bearded dragon is so difficult. People don't understand that. I'm like, it's not like this equals this. That's not how this works. So, you know, how, how big is the dragon? Is the dragon going through a gross birth? Is it not going through a, a gross birth? You know, what are your, what temps are you running? You know, is it, um, you know, are your bugs half inch or are they five eighths inch? You know, like, I mean, all of these different things make a huge difference. And so, you know, new keepers are oftentimes, you know, my, my pet keepers um, are oftentimes like, well, I don't know when to stop. Like, I don't want to, um, I don't want to feed too much, but I don't want to feed too little. So I always tell them, I'm like, look, <clears throat> look at it this way. Think of yourself. And this works well for the general public that, you know, that has a pet. So I always tell them, I'm like, look at it this way. Okay. When you sit down for Thanksgiving for a big meal, okay. And you're eating and you're enjoying your meal. There's a point in which you start to slow down where you're just kind of like, oh, the belt's feeling a little tight. I need, you know, I'm breathing a little deeper. Like I really kind of like, I need to stop, but it's really good. I want to eat it. I want the ice cream and the cake afterwards, this, that, and the other. I said, that's what you kind of have to look at your animal and say, where are they at in this process? Is the animal, is it like still running like really fast and target feeding and going after it? Or is it still targeting, but it's slowing down a bit. It's, you know, taking that extra breath to kind of like loosen its belt, you know, where is it at in that process? Um, and so that clicks for a lot of pet keepers and they go, oh, okay, like I get it. It's not like that blanket, you know, the old school blanket of, you know, as much feeders as they can eat within 15 minutes because obviously they're opportunistic eaters and they'll, some of them, not all of them, but some of them will just keep going um, and, and literally stuff themselves. So, 
you know, I'm just like, you know, look for them to, to just, you, you can see signs in them that they actually are getting full. Don't let them hit that point, you know, stop. Um, so, yeah. That's actually, that's brilliant. I've, I've struggled with that question so much because I don't know how to answer. I just, I'm like, oh no, I stop when I feel that it's right. Like, so one customer's like, how many bugs do I feed? And I'm like, mm. Uh, right and it's like are you feeding are you are you feeding a super worm are you feeding a meal worm are you feeding a black soldier how big is it are you feeding crickets are you feeding roaches like i mean there's all these different so i'm like look let's just simplify this like let's just break this down like when you're eating this is the process you go through and they're like oh and it makes it a lot simpler for you know the general keeper the parents with the kids and this that and the other and it just it's it's cut a lot of the you know, a lot of that. I don't know what to do. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I know what I'm saying next time a customer asks me. <laughs> yeah, because so, at first, when you start keeping, the thought of saying to someone, you stop when the baby beardy is, is not that hungry anymore. And it's like, they're so foreign to us that we're like, well, how do you know? You're like, you'll know. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you start to be able to look at them especially with individuals and you're like mm, no he's but, he's done but now see, right exactly but but here's the thing though with a lot of pet keepers they don't see that they'll never see mm -hmm. that because they're pet keepers not breeders and we have to keep that in mind um <clears throat> when i'm talking to a breeder versus when i'm talking to a pet keeper my vocabulary changes how i how i communicate with that person changes um, because their understanding of that animal is going to be completely different. And I think that's some, you know, that's where sometimes we fail is that we think that they know or they should know and they don't because a lot of times this is a first pet for them. It's not like, you know, you and I who have kept thousands of pets over the, you know, thousands of animals over the years or have had, you know, five, 10, 20 years of experience. This a lot of times is their first time experience and they don't see those things. So we have to find creative ways to, to allow them to see that. Um, so that the, the light goes off and they go, oh, okay, yeah, I, I understand that. You have to relate it to something that they already know. I see a lot of, um, I don't want to say spoil, but they're, they have like such a panic about them starving and they're literally, it's a little chubby beardy and they're like, he just won't eat his greens. They're like, he will just stop giving that much Yeah, bugs. stop with the well. so many of the bugs. Yeah, yeah. And and that's the thing. I mean, everybody's, a f people are, or people that, that have, that really do care. I'm not talking about the neglect situations where you have an animal that's not being properly cared for, but mm -hmm. overcare is a problem. Like mm -hmm. overcare is a thing. Um, and people think because the animal's eating that it needs the food, that it, that it, because it's willing to eat, that you should be feeding it more and more and more. And so um, obesity in dragons is obviously, you know, a, a huge problem. Um, huge problem so i'm like no 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 <laughs> you know <laughs> slow down you want them to have enough food but you don't want to have an overabundance of food because that just like in us that generates fatty liver cancers you know you know kidney failure you know you're building up fat around those organs you know this leads to premature death it leads to egg binding it leads to all kinds of problems so yeah do you feed fruit in the diet or are you a fruit-free person I'm a fruit-free person for my dragons. Same. I feed them dried, I feed them flowers. Like I put mixed flower when I'm pulling the weeds and stuff, then I use a variety, like I said, like the dragon fuel. And um, I have my own, you know, I get organic dried, this, that, and the other. So I kind of create my own blend um, with the greens. And so I do that. So they're getting colors, um, but they're not, I don't feed fruit. And, and my clients, I discourage them from from feeding fruit i let them know because everybody always wants to feed fruit because they've seen like these little you know videos with the little dragon that's running and eating watermelon and this that and the other and i'm like low glycemic if you're gonna feed a, a fruit make sure it's low glycemic we're talking like a berry like if you want to you know if you want to have the experience feed your dragon a, a you know a blueberry on sundays go for it um but you know, I tell them to make sure that it's low glycemic and it's more of a treat and an infrequent offering rather than part of their staple diet. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the fruit-free category. They don't 
find fruit in the wild in no. any, in any study there's no fruit and there's a, there is no. a lot of flowers though there is a lot of flowers oh yeah and that's that i try to tell i like i tell people i'm like they're drawn to the color not the fact that it's actually fruit like it's the color that they're seeing that is causing them to go after that they're looking for that flower they're seeing the brightly colored uh, flower and the phytonutrients and this that and the other that they would get from that flower that's why they're drawn to it they're not drawn to it because it's fruit it's sweet fruit like you don't want to feed them free sweet fruit um, so, but I mean, I have some, you know, you have some people that kind of almost insist, if you will, that they want fruit because this, that, and the other, I'm like, okay, I mean, I'm not going to get out. I don't like getting in. I don't like putting myself in a position where I tell somebody like, no, you, you can't, I think that there's, you know, there's, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of harm to a dragon for them to have a blueberry once a week. You know what I mean? And so I, I kind of find that, okay, people that are insistent with fruit, I'm like, okay, but let's think about this. Like, this is what they're really after. Like, if you really, really feel like they have to do it because you've seen the, then a blueberry, <laughs> one blueberry. <laughs> I think it all comes back down to looking after their teeth as well. They've got that acridot tooth is basically their jaw. Once their jaw's gone, their jaw's gone. <laughs> exactly. Oh, for real. Yeah. I talk about that, like decay, you know, decay of the jaw and, um, you know, just like they're not designed to, to consume sugar. They're not designed for that. Like that's not part of their regular diet. Um, so you are doing your animal a disservice if you're sitting there. Yeah, he'll eat the watermelon, but you're doing the animal a disservice. You're shortening their lifespan. You're, put, you're opening them up to... Uh, a lot of you know additional risks as far as with their health um, by by doing that. So, how do you feel about like an ad lib like just bowls of mealworms just constant in their enclosure? No, I don't know. Maybe no, because I mean some some animals. It's you know like we were talking about you know all animals are they're all bearded dragons are a little bit different. You know they all have their different. So some some of them would just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat until they drop or others have that stop button in there and they just go okay i'm good you know like i know they're available i'm good so i just tell i just as a general rule of thumb i tell everybody it's like no just don't leave that bowl there um that's not a good idea i've seen a lot of mbd cases from it just having like this ad lib amount of constant phosphorus but they're not also thinking about having a constant amount of calcium to counter that so right like, exactly oh yeah because the calcium doesn't stay on the bugs it you know drops off and you've got this huge you know bowl of, of worms sitting there um and and you don't have the supplement there to kind of balance that out then yeah for sure it's a problem no i don't yes yeah, it's, it's one of those ones where it's, i drop it's, bugs yeah I, I like controlling how much they get mm -hmm. rather than just yeah and i mean some of my some of my girls are you know if they start to look a little bit fluffy i'm like back you down girl um whereas the one next door may be like right on so i'm looking at each animal where they're at in the course of a year and i'm tailoring it to that animal and what they what i visually see what what do i see here do I see some potential for obesity creeping up? Then I'm backing down on the bugs. Do I see that they need more fuel? Um, then I'm increasing the bugs. So it's about each individual animal and not just this one size fits all. So, you know, back, back years ago, like when I started, it was like, you know, you have to feed each adult 10 superworms every day. It's like, why, you know, 10 per, and if you're not, you're doing them disservice. So one of my mentors years and years ago, um, you know, I pointed it out to her because she, she was losing animals to um, fatty liver. And I'm like, you know, your animals are huge. So they're dying and they're getting fatty liver. So how about you give them six worms, you know, three worms, not eating on Sundays or Thursdays. I don't know, for me, Thursdays and Sundays are like my two days where I really have a tendency, like no food or, or whatever. That those are two days that I'm like, okay, totally off. Um, I don't really feed anything on Sundays year round, any of my adults at all, period. Um, I think it's good for them to be able to clear everything out and they don't have to constantly, like we're just finding out like for us, for example, constant snacking, you know, 18 hours a day when you're up is detrimental to one's health. Um, whereas intermittent fasting and kind of, you know, eating, uh, being a little bit more mindful about how many times you're eating and giving your digestive system a rest so that you're able to go into repair mode. I think that pretty much works, you know, all across the board. Um, and that gets ignored a lot with the dragons because 
you know, in the wild, they're obviously not sitting there at a smorgasbord pigging out uh, all throughout the day. So they may go three days without eating. Four I'm days, five sure days. That, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. So even with like holidays, people go away for like a weekend and they'll like book holidays and drop their bit of dragon off to us. I'm like, that's just so stressful. Just leave it. I know. I tell and again, you know, people I always tell all of my clients, I'm like, just contact me directly. If you have a question, just ask. Like I'll just I'll tell you, I have no problem with that. I'd rather you ask me than try to figure it out online or go with some information that's been parroted from A to Z, you know, where everybody thinks that they know what's best. I'm just like, just ask me, you know, if you're going away from the weekend, you can do this, this, and this, like you don't, they don't need any food. You're fine. Like go, you know, this is what I want you to do. So, you know, I just walk them through the steps based on the scenario and the age of their animal and whatnot. I think it comes with confidence, doesn't it? Once you've, like, even like brumation, like everyone is like so panicked and worried about brumation. And then once you've done it, you're like, oh, then you do it sex time. And like, oh, and then they just like turn lights off. And you're like, bye. So right. You're point, like, I'll yeah. see you. See yeah, you later. For sure. Yeah. So like, yeah, even for like, real. once you get to a certain level of confidence, like, oh, when I used to go away for like a week at a time. And all I would do is because all of those supplements from Arcadia, all of it was the precursor and the water soluble. I would leave like a bowl of that in there for her, make mm-hmm. sure someone would pop in, like make sure the lights came on, maybe change the water bowl and things like that. And I just left her for a week. I mean, she wasn't yeah. she wasn't anywhere. She was probably a little bit overweight at the time anyway. So I was like, just leave her. Um, yeah. I just think people just waste money just just like booking things into the holiday when really you're just stressing well, the animal out. And they're trying to do the right thing. I mean, the problem, again, goes back to social media and everybody like parroting information that is really old and outdated and, and accurate. Um, that really is information that never should have occurred to begin with. I mean, it's just, you know, the wrong information sometimes gets out there and it, they just run with it. And you're like, no, 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 no. So they don't want to be labeled as the bad beardy parent. You know, they don't want to be labeled as, you know, neglecting their animal or this, that, and the other. And it's like, it's not a dog. You know, this is different. Like, this is how they're different. This is why they're different and they're like oh (laughs) you know it's like okay I got it I'm good (laughs) but but sometimes it takes a while and I mean I have moms that are like terrified you know like are you sure it's okay they're gonna be fine I'm like yes totally fine think about it this way got it you know and then and then they're able to but but I mean if I did like some if I if I try to engage somebody in, in some of these groups then you know it would be like almost like a war would break out like (laughs) Do you know how many thousands and thousands of dragons I've raised? I got it. <laughs> you know, like I'm telling you, you know. But they read in a book this, and it's like, no, no. Yeah, I mean, the folklore husbandry has got such a grip on so many people. They just don't. Most people don't even realize what folklore husbandry is, and I think that is one of the main issues with the hobby is that education isn't there. Exactly. Dog exactly, for as well, sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So let's get on to the breeding then. Obviously, this is this is something that I've wanted to do for ages. Bearded dragons are one of my main loves in terms of species. I've always wanted to breed bearded dragons for the sake of like I wanted to experience breeding bearded dragons. But there is this there's this culture of like, oh, never breed bearded dragons. They're overproduced. You should only ever rescue and not buy. Like, how do you feel about that? Or do you feel like because you're producing high end bearded dragons, it's like a separate category to that? Or so when you say. So when you say high end, like when you say high, what do you think high end is? Because high end is different things to different people. What is your That's idea of high true. end? Because mine, I think, might be a little different. Than you. My idea of high end is not a super, super, super the reddest dragon I can possibly get, or the you know the the most bold stripe. Or it's a healthy animal with good conformation, with an even growth rate that I know is going to go into a pet. You know that was properly cared for, that had all the right supplementation, that had the right start. That I know that can confidently go into you know a pet home and not crash on them. That I know that that animal is you know is if they do as I ask or they kind of follow this general guideline that I've given them. Um, that with my guidance, they're able to have a healthy pet for years to come. To me, that is a healthy, that is a high end animal. It's not like the most extremes of things. And I think that's um, part of the problem. A lot of times is people think of a high end animal as just being like the reddest or the most extreme. And that I've seen some horrible, horrible, um, you know, like some heartbreaking animals that people have spent thousands and thousands of dollars on that were in very, very poor condition. And to me, that's not a high-end animal. I don't, do you see what I'm saying with that? So 
I mean, I think that there is always, if your definition of a high-end animal is a healthy animal that that has been given the right start and has come from somebody knowledgeable and knows what they're doing and has a passion for the animal. Cause you have to have a passion in bearded dragons where you are screwed. If you don't like, cause they're very time consuming. They are the most time consuming species that I've worked with. Um, and I don't think there's anything out there that takes more time and devotion than bearded dragons. You have to love them. And if you don't get out, cause it's a problem. So I think there will always be, I don't think there'll ever be any shortage of demand for a quality animal like for a well-produced animal. The problem is, is that everybody is rat trade, you know, is, is chasing their, you know, is chasing this, oh, well, I have to have the most extreme of this and I have to have the most extreme of that. And it's the detriment of the animal. It's like, oh, well, it's high end. No, it's not high end. It's not high end at all. The thing is gonna die by the time it's nine months old. That's not high end. So I don't think that there's too many dragons that are being produced at all. I think that there is a shortage of high quality animals. You know, there is a shortage of that, of high-end dragons that meet my definition of high-end. There is a shortage because I don't ever have any problems. Even when like this year we had, you know, the market adjusted some and the reason why it adjusted people, you know, there's a number of reasons why it adjusted, but we haven't had like a new mutation in the bearded, you know, anytime. So all, all species go through cycles. So as far as the the, you know, the selling cycles, the prices come up, they come down. So when you have a new mutation come out, for example, like the zero that drives everything else. So it not only drives the zero, it drives demand for bearded dragons, period. So when you don't have a, a, a new mutation that is really generating the interest of the public, then that price point starts to, to come down. So um, yeah, anyway. Where was I going with that? I don't know. But <laughs> to answer your to answer your question, I think my version of high end was something that's not just your your normal bit of dragon that's been bred by everyone in their bedroom um, that's floating around for five dollars. That that is what I think the issue is in a lot of the UK. I mean, we had that problem to the extreme like a few years ago where. Keepers had to start this thing called like incubate two campaign, like incubate only two eggs sort of thing, because there were so many to the point where people were like putting up trays under their bed at like five, five quid a bit of dragon things that like got extreme at one point. So most of the market, most of the problems, at least in the U.S., okay, that I can speak for in the U.S., most of the problems are stemming from. Not, yeah, like I said, not too many bearded dragons, but too many quality bearded dragons. Like if I go through Morph Market and I search Morph Market, I can pick out who is going to have a short life. And it's sad. It's sad. And some of them are not inexpensive. Um, but I think a lot of times it's the, the, the production machines that, that produce in mass to provide for the contracts, you know, for the big box stores. Um, that's where a huge portion of the problem lies is when they get flooded and there's a bit of a, a market correction, they don't tailor back their breeding program necessarily to accommodate for that. So because their wheels are so big, it takes, you know, because they're going so fast and they're producing so many, it takes them longer to slow down. So you end up with an over influx of dragons, which is what happened this year. You had the pandemic. So we should have actually had for bearded dragons, at least in the United States, I'm speaking for the United States here. Um, so in the United States, we should have entered in a correction in 2020. Like I was predicting that. I'm like, we, it's time for a correction. Like we haven't had a new mutation in a while. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm seeing. Like we're ready for that correction. We're ready for it to slow down a little bit. Um, but the pandemic came around and that pushed it. And that actually, I had slowed down to accommodate that. <laughs> um, and then it, you know, we had something very unusual happen, which was the pandemic. Everybody stayed at home. Everybody had to have a pet. So the demand for them shot up through the roof. The prices on them shot up through the roof. Um, it was unbelievable. Of course, as that comes to an end now, that can got kind of just kicked down the road. So what should have happened in 2020 happened in 2022, where we started to see that slowdown. Um, but even though like my price point, as far as my wholesale, what, you know, cause I have a variety of um, pet stores and independent mom and pop shops that I provide dragons to, healthy dragons to, um, that choose to, to shop it with me for that. Um, like, even though I had to adjust my pricing down, I've still had a place for every animal to go. 
So, but the problem is, is you have breeders out there who don't have places for their animals to go. They don't, they don't establish these connections and they don't establish themselves in the industry um, prior to engaging in, I'm gonna put 10 pairs together. And then they have 10 pairs and they have all these babies and there's no place for them to go. Well, in a market that's really strong where you have an uptick and there's a new mutation or pandemic, then that's not a problem. The market can absorb that. But once that stops, the market can't absorb that and there's no place for them to go. And then it's a problem. So I think it's breeders, you know, breeders need to be more mindful of what's going on in the market. Is there a new mutation? Is there not? They need to have the connections. They need to have, um, you know, they need to have built a reputation so people know who they are and what they're about and what their quality is and what they stand behind. And, you know, it's not, it, and they need to start off slow. And, and that's, that's where we really run into problem. And that's really with any species. So that's, that's actually fascinating. Like that was, I hope that answered that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I, I, that just captivated me entirely. So when you're talking about like monitoring morph market and the market, so as a breeder, and obviously this is your full-time job, are you actually like sitting on morph market and watching what's going on around you and things like that? And when you talk about monitoring, what actually goes into monitoring the market? Um, just looking at cell rates, like you can tell by how many animals are up at a time, like kind of what the cell rate is. Um, you know, talking to other breeder friends within the industry, knowing how fast um, my accounts are selling through dragons, like what their sell rate is. Are they ordering from me every two weeks? Or are they ordering once a month? So you can really get a really good gauge of what's going on with the market. So like when I noticed that there was a definite, <laughs> so <laughs> this year was kind of funny. It caught me off guard. This year it was a little bit uh, unusual again because of the pandemic, but you know, I was looking at it and I'm like, we're due for a slowdown. And, but then you're like, well, it's probably not going to slow down yet. And then it's like, but you're due for a slowdown, but it's not because the, it's, the circumstances were very unusual this time with the pandemic. It's not something that I've had, you know, obviously something that I've had experience with is what happens with the market when there's a pandemic, like once it ends, what happens, you know? So, so this year was a little bit different, but once I noticed that um, the market was slowing, then I stopped pairing my animals. Most people don't. They stop still have X number of animals that come out of cooling. They do this, they do that. They pair them all together. Like I have a lot of females. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but I have a decent number of females that I never even bred this year that were very breedable, but I didn't because I saw what was going on with the market. And most people don't have the ability to put the stop on that and go, you know what? The market can't handle this. I need to not do this because this is going to cause me a headache. Hmm. I mean, not just taking into account what happens with the market, but taking into account what happens to you, right? Can you move the animals? Do you have an outlet for them? Where are they going to go? So um, I have the ability to, what, what I've done is like some of my females are not with a male at all. And I have the ability to kind of like ramp it up or I, my plans are in place when I do my breeding charts where I can ramp up a little bit or I can ramp down. So I can modify um, how many dragons I'm producing in a year. So will you, before you pair something, then go, go to like one of these shops that you're supplying and be like, are you buying this year or are you looking to get any blah, 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 blah. Do you like look to get some sort of confirmation in this place already before you even put the animals together? Now, I mean, I don't have, I don't, I don't have like, I don't have contracts with my pet stores. Um, so I just know based on past years, because I've been doing this so long about how many they take per month and at what time of year they take that. So, you know, some of my pet shops take, um, some of my accounts take, you know, X number in April, but they take a third of that in August because that's during the summer months. So during the summer months, everybody's on vacation. Nobody wants to get a dragon right now because kids are out of school. Everybody's on holiday, you know, they're traveling. And then as soon as the first cold front comes along in the US, demand goes back up. So um, right. it's, you know, it's very, very much like a cycle. So you have the cycle that runs every year throughout the calendar year of when they're higher in demand and when they're lower in demand. And then you also have the cycle as far as like what's going on with the, you know, is there any morph out? Is there not any morph out? Is there this, is there that? So there's a bunch of different things that you're looking at and going, okay, how many, you know, how many do I want to actually produce? It's not just like, oh, I want to produce this many because I want to. It's like, okay, do you have a place for them? <laughs> 
So obviously, there's there is a lot of bearded dragon breeding that isn't a, a like gene. There is like this non Mendelian inheritance, the selective breeding, and it's like working for quality and you're taking your time and you're doing this this and that do you feel that some sort of sort of protects the market whereas like things like ball pythons where it's like a gene i'll buy that i can replicate that instantly and it falls quickly do you feel like it protects against that slightly it does to an extent but with that i want to say but the quality the quality of the animal has to be there as well so that's that's what protects you if you're doing it right like don't do it half ass. And, and produce twice as many than you could by doing it the right way with half as many animals. Like do it the right way. That's what protects you. Doing it the right way is the biggest protection of all. I can sell normals, no problem, um, because I'm doing it the right way. Now, I mean, they obviously want them to be more red or more yellow or whatever, because that's what, you know, like for example, in a pet store, that's what draws people to them more so than a normal, but I still produce some normals for outcrossing, so. And I want my normals to be just as healthy as, you know, my others. So for outcrossing, you have a, like a selection normals to decide that you will bring in now and again, like a, say like a red line that you'll outcross and then bring back in again or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have quite a few lines. So, and, you know, I don't necessarily breed them all every year. So I'll rotate them back in to do an outcrossing or whatever. Um, so, yeah. And then I bring in from outside from, a few select dragon breeders that I trust. Um, so, but you know, and that's another thing people don't understand is breeder, uh, new breeders don't understand is that when you, like when I, when I purchase an animal to grow up, number one, I like to purchase a baby or a juvenile at largest. I don't like buying adults. I don't want to buy adults because it's somebody else's problem. Why are they selling it? Like, is it too old? Did it not have the results they wanted? Like, I don't want to buy an adult. I don't want to buy an adult because I don't know their history. And I don't want to buy an adult because I want to know how it was raised. I want to raise the animal. I want to know what the animal, what the healthy animal is. Did it ever have any problems? Did it have this? Did it have this? Was there any period of time where the animal's health was at risk? I'm only going to know that if I raise the animal. So I don't actually sell my adults, um, you know, to like, I don't, you won't see me listing my adults online because I don't, I, I put them all in pet homes. They all go to pet homes or to people that I know are putting in pet homes um, because I think it's, I hate seeing that. It, it breaks my heart to see that. Like I'll raise an animal and then I'll be like, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to use this one in my program next year for X, Y, Z reason, whatever. Maybe I have too many yellows. Maybe, you know, I didn't like the hatchery, whatever it was to help the animal, but I'm like, I'm not going to move forward with it. I hate putting it up and then watching it jump from breeder to breeder to breeder. It's like, oh, well, I have the bloodlines now. I've seen, I have the genetics now and they list it and they'll literally say in their ad, I have the genetics now. So next. And I hate that. I absolutely hate that. Um, so, you know, when I buy an animal, um, I buy it with the full understanding that that animal may not develop as I hope it to. So for every 10 animals that I purchase, for every 10 dragons that I purchase to grow out, maybe one of them makes it into my breeding program, maybe three, maybe none. Like that happens and that should happen. I think people think, oh, well, I paid $400 for a baby. I have to breed it. No, you don't. <laughs> you know, if it's got a big old underbite, you know, there's nothing wrong with the animal as far as a pet, find a nice help pet home for it. Like that's part of it. So, and I think that's uh, something that small breeders have a tendency to maybe err in because they haven't had the experience that I have had with that and, and knowing that, you know, what the final result of that is. So, so how much would you say it, you, in proportion is it like pet home sales compared to other breeders? I sell a lot of pets, but um, it's just, I'm very, maybe, maybe because I'm a mom, I don't know, like I have two kids. Um, my son's 24. He grew up with dragons like almost his whole life. My daughter is 10. That's all she's ever known is a house full of dragons. So I can relate to parents. I can relate to moms and 
you know, what the responsibility is to take on the pet, you know, because the kid doesn't always take on the full responsibilities that maybe they should, or, you know, sometimes I'll talk to, to uh, you know, a parent and I'll talk to the kid and I'm like, you know, I'm just letting you know, like, you know, this kid is definitely ready for a dragon. Like they've done their research and they're like, what about this? And they're asking very intelligent questions. And, um, and then I've had others where I'm like, well, you know, you may want to research it a little bit more, ask me questions, decide if this is right. Like I won't encourage them, like, don't, you know, I won't encourage them to, to do this yet, to hit that button. I'm like, well, you know, you may want to look into this and consider this. Um, but I get a lot of referrals from that. So I get a, a lot of my business is pet homes, like a lot. Um, my vet has always sent me a lot of clients that maybe had a bad poor experience with pet store, you know, where they bought an animal and a failure to thrive. And so they, they refer them to me or, um, because they know how nutty I am about the health, you know, about the care of my animals. Um, so I could actually have more, um, retail sales as far as listing more, but I limit how many I list every week or every two weeks based on what's going on in my life. So, if I have a really, really busy schedule, then I won't list. If I have, um, you know, it, it just depends. Like I know how many, I know how long it takes per customer, per client potentially every time I make a sale. So if I sell seven dragons in a week, I have to be prepared for the next two weeks to field X number of questions. And I need to make sure that I have the time for that. So. That's why a lot of a lot of my animals actually go to wholesale pet stores too, and I don't list anywhere near what I could, um, because I know that I wouldn't be able to give the, um, you know, my number one priority is caring for my animals. Period. Because if that's not there, you're screwed. Um, my second priority is to those that have purchased from me because they have an animal in their home that needs questions answered. So I want to answer those questions, and then my third is selling stuff online and trying to get pictures and this, that, and the other to a new, you know, to a new potential client. So, um, and there's balance in that. And I know how many questions I can field every week, you know, like after an expo, like I've got Tenley this weekend, this coming weekend, I know not to list next week because I'm going to have a bunch of questions coming in from, ten, you know, based on what my sales are in Tenley, as far as new keepers, inexperienced keepers, I know what I'm going to need to be able to do the following week. Like, can I list or not list? And if I list, I need to list like three or five, you know, or just respond to people that, you know, are asking me locally for a dragon or something. So you have to manage your time. People like you are so important in the reptile industry. And this is where breeders aren't appreciated. Like, it is, you are that person who holds that hand in that first experience. And that is such an amazing thing and I wish people would seek that out more um, because a lot of the time people just do they buy that baby beady that they see in the shop and they don't think about the support system behind it or the health mm -hmm. and um, people look for the cheapest animal versus where they could be paying someone who has bred them correctly and they've got that support and they've got your 20 years of experience to lean on and learn from so I think you do an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely, people will ask me, they'll say, well, aren't you concerned about, you know, being in competition with an animal at a pet store? You know, I mean, like one of the big box stores, you know, like, you know, the, the huge, you know, big, huge, big box operations. And I said, no, I'm not concerned at all because it's a different, a lot of times it's a different client. It's a different type of customer. And if it's my type of customer and it's somebody that really cares about the animal is not going to treat it like the goldfish. If they're going to treat it like the goldfish. I don't want them as a customer anyway, because that breaks my heart and it ticks me off. Um, if somebody takes an animal that, you know, I've spent the time to, you know, I, I, I make, I go through a tremendous amount. I mean, I'm one of the, I'm one of the few breeders where my clients actually get my cell phone and people that have been in the industry, as long as I have, give me shit for it all the time. They're like, why do you do that? That's stupid. And I'm like, but I want them, to, I want that mom who's freaking out over something to be able to reach me. You know, that's, that's a rare thing, but, um, but yeah, so I mean, I try to make sure that that they do have um, access. And of course, I lost myself. I don't even remember where I was going with this. But um, yeah, I totally lost myself. 
<laughs> Sometimes my mind goes faster than my mouth and it gets me into trouble. Uh, oh, but yeah, so, so clients that purchase from the big box store, a lot of times it's, you know, it's an emotional purchase. An animal is an emotional purchase. So the little kid sees the animal in the glass and they're like, mommy, I love it. Or, you know, even just the, you know, whoever looking in at that animal, they're like, oh my gosh, I love that. And you, it's, it's emotional. So you don't necessarily, when it's emotional, you're not necessarily going through all of the steps of what I need, what I don't need. They're just like, oh, it's cute. I need to take it home. So I don't always think these things through. Um, so people that have had a poor experience like that oftentimes end up referred to me or somebody like me, you know, there's a lot of great breeders out there. So, you know, they get, they get referred to us um, or people that know that experience through being on social media and reading poor experiences and sad stories and stuff will automatically seek out uh, a breeder that has been around a long time or that has uh, a good rate. You don't even have to be around a long time. Just somebody who really shows that they're doing it right and that they're making the effort and that they're, you know, so, um, so, so I think that market is always going to be there. Like, I don't really worry about that as my point, you know, I'm not worried about what the pet stores are, or, you know, what the big box stores are doing. I don't care because that's, you know, I'm not worried about it. I'm always worried about me. What am I doing to be better? What am I doing to, you know, to go to the next level? Am I making sure that, you know, that I'm not getting, you know, that I'm not, um, you know, chilling a little bit too much or that, you know, that I, I you know, I think competition is good because it keeps you honest and keeps you on your toes. And, you know, if you're in a market where there's no competition, um, sometimes people get complacent and they cut corners and, you know, so. I can honestly say I've never had a conversation with the breeder that actually goes to this extent. I've always had ideas like, oh, if I want to do this, I'll do it this way and this, that. But I've never actually come across someone who's actually doing the, the things that pop into my head. Or sometimes, like, a breeder's standard of, like, gold star breeding is, like, the collection is free from disease. And it's like, to me, that's such a basic. That shouldn't be what your gold standard is. But it just feels like night and day. Pray city over here. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, what do you feel? Oh, my next question was going to be, what is your most important trait you focus on? But I believe your answer is going to be health, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So a gene that I, I like the idea of is the paradox. Obviously, previous books and people have claimed that it's not um, replicatable. Obviously, what your experience with that? It's heritable. It's, it's very heritable. heritable. Mm -hmm. It's just not... It's not as predictable as everybody would want it to be. So, um, and it occurs at different times. I mean, I've sold dragons. I can't even tell you how many dragons I've sold and that I've sent to either like one of my pet store accounts or that I've sent home with a, with a customer. And then three months later, I get a picture and they're like, what is going on here? And I'm like, oh, that's a paradox. Scratch you. Like, that's cool. So, you know, I tried to, um, because I had paradox first pop out in my lines, it popped out for the first time in 2012. Okay. So 10 years ago. Um, and the first one that I ever produced, his name was Keelan and it was pretty radical. I mean, he was total, he just so happened to be a holdback. Like he was the male that I held. That was a holdback. I liked him. I kept him for all the right reasons. And then he went into shed when he was like, I don't know, five or six months old. And he, and while he was in shed, I'm like, Hmm. I'm like, he's washing out. Um, he was a hypo leatherback. And when he shut out, he was a totally different animal. So it happens at all different stages. So because of that, let's, let's run through this. So if you have, if you have a female that lays three clutches and they're all 30 eggs each, and she has a hundred percent hatch rate, then you're talking about and some of my girls will lay every 14 to 17 days and then others lay every 30 days or whatever. So you have this like anywhere from, you know, 14, usually 17 to 30 days ish um, between clutches. Then all of a sudden you have 90 babies that you're going to hold back and watch to see if they turn. And how long are you going to hold those and where are you going to put them? Because you have to divide off. People don't think about that as the animals get larger, you can't keep five in, a, in an enclosure anymore. You have to go to three and then to two and then to one. Where are you gonna put them all? The amount of food, the amount of, you know, and there, and, and dragons, unlike some, so some species, dragons are like, I hate to say it this way, but this is, so dragons are kind of like a ticking time bomb, okay? 
you only have so long to get your numbers down, okay? So you have your wholesale accounts, which are typically gonna be, you know, your dragons that go out to the, to the pet stores and stuff. You usually send those out at around five inches, six grams, right around in there. Your retail for me, um, if I'm confident in my bloodline and, you know, and I, I mean, I know my bloodlines well, it's like eight grams, six inches plus, you know, six to eight inch mark. Um, so you, but they grow very quickly. So you only have so long for them to go bye-bye. The pet stores don't want a 12 and 14 and 16 and 18 inch dragons. They don't want those the, because the customer wants what? They want the little baby. They want the little itty bitty baby because it's cute. They want, they want to watch it grow up, which I don't blame them. I'd want, you know, if I was a little kid, I'd want to watch, want to watch my dragon grow up too. So the demand for the animal is when they're small, not when they're huge. So you hold back 90 animals from one pairing. That's only if she lays three clutches. What if she lays five? Um, you hold back 90 animals. All of your space is gone. How long are you going to hold them? So I did chase it. It's fun. I love watching them change. But over the last couple of years, I've kind of moved into a state where I'm just kind of like, okay, well, if they happen to change and I still have them for all the right reasons, then cool. If I don't have them, okay, well, whatever. Somebody else gets to enjoy the change. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of times the customer, because they're not familiar with the mutation, they don't even know they have a paradox. So they don't even realize, like they'll just send me an update because a lot of my clients will send me updates to their dragons. And they'll send me an update and I'm like, oh, you got a paradox. And they're like, what? They're like, we didn't know what happened. And I'm like, it's a paradox. So it's kind of funny, but yeah, I mean, dragons are, unfortunately, you know, they're, you only have so long to move them out because um, they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and they eat more and more food and your health and your food expenses go up and up and up and your space is completely, you know, because as they get bigger, then you have to separate them. So they, they are kind of a, for a breeder, they are kind of a ticking time bomb. So are you going to hang on to 90 little bombs that are getting bigger really fast? And that's just one pairing? No. So, um, but, the, but it is absolutely heritable. And I've had um, clutches where I've had like, you know, that I know of um, upwards of seven or nine animals. And it's also highly variable too. So that's the other problem too. Um, if the animal isn't a train, so you typically see translucent animals that are a paradox more so than you do non. And that's because it's easier to spot. It's easier to see the change. It's only because it's easier to identify. It's not because there's more translucent animals that are paradox. And initially, which wasn't the breeder's fault at all, it was just based on the limited amount of information that was available at the time that they first popped out. It was thought back then that it had something to do with hypo and trance. Okay, that there was some sort of a relationship there that was that was potentially. That's not correct, um, and it's not. And so that was kind of paired in. So a lot, most people still think that way, but it's, but I mean, I've proven that not to be true repeatedly. I have animals, titanium, I still have them. I think he's six years old now. Um, he's a hypo. There's no, he's not head for trans, there's no trans. Um, fluffy, um, not head for trans at all. Uh, he's head hypo. Um, so I have plenty of examples of animals are, Sorry, those are the names of them. <laughs> My daughter named the one Fluffy. Um, but anyway, um, so, so, so yeah, it's just because they're so variable. And where do you draw the line between calling one an actual paradox versus not? So is it five scales? Is it 100 scales? Is it 200 scales? Like I have produced, I can't even tell you. I mean, if you want to talk about low expression paradox, I can't even tell you how many I've produced over the years. It's a ton. So high expression, you know, moderate expression to high expression, I've produced quite a few. Um, but a lot of times, you know, they, they show themselves after they've left the building. So, and then sometimes, you know, you'll have them that, you know, show up and it's just in one little spot and you may or may not, you know, the average pet keeper won't even notice that one little spot. So going from like indoors to outdoors, have you noticed if it's been 
clutch size of the same individual from indoors to up. No difference, no. No. The bloodline. The bloodline is the indicator for me. Like, I have some bloodlines that just lay. I mean, I have one bloodline that I've been running since, I don't know, probably 2008 or something like that. And the girls are just ginormous and they lay a lot of eggs. And then I have other bloodlines that don't lay as many eggs. So, you know, they'll lay 18, whereas I have some lines that'll lay upwards of 40. Um, so, but a lot of times it's in the 30 range, you know, for that particular bloodline, which is still quite a few. So, um, but no difference as far as indoor, outdoor. Mm -mm. You obviously have like variation as well. So like if one girl produces like a, a 15 clutch, then a, then a 20, then an 18, like how do you begin to get, as it over multiple years, you get a gauge on what their general clutch size is going to be before you start selecting for clutch size and longevity. And... Well, I don't really, I'm not really looking for when I'm selecting my animals, I'm not necessarily looking for how many babies that particular bloodline produces. I'm really not. It's not something that I really put into the formula. Are the babies healthy? Did they hatch out? You know, did they all, you know, did the siblings and them kind of all grow up pretty evenly or were they, you know, were they really staggered? You know, those are the things I'm looking for. It's not like, oh, well, she only lays 15 eggs. So therefore I don't want to hold back from this. I don't do that I, for me anyway. I don't do that. Some breeders may, I don't. I'm looking for the recovery rate on the female. You know, some females um, have like, don't even look like they've laid. They don't even look like they've even laid a clutch of eggs. Like you can just feel that the cavity is empty. You know, I mean, they'll look a little bit, but I mean, they really like the recovery is like two days. And then you have other females that have a little bit more difficult recovery. You know, they're a little bit slower to put the weight back on and this, that, and the other. So um, I'm looking for blood when I'm holding back my girls, I'm selecting from um, my pairing, you know, from, from, you know, selecting offspring from a pairing that had the female had a really good recovery rate. Um, you know, I want her to bounce back like fast, um, for her health, not for, you know, but that's, that's one thing that I look for. And, you know, if, um, how they utilize their calcium and stuff like that. So I, I supplement with liquid calcium while the girls grab it, which a lot of breeders don't do. Um, I do that. And that is my eggs look much different. Like when I'm searching through social media, I notice huge differences in my eggs um, because of the nutrition that the female is receiving and the male is receiving prior. So I don't see this de decalcification, the windowing that you do in a lot of breeders. So obviously like, because you're focusing on so much health and whatnot, what's the long, the, the oldest bit of dragging you've had? Well, I re unfortunately, so that's the drawback to being a breeder <laughs> is when you retire them, you can only keep so many. So that is uh, the bummer part. So I have friends that, um, you know, only keep dragons as pets. So the dragons that I really, um, you know, cause you, you hate having your favorite, but you always have those that you're kind of partial to. So, um, you know, I had mentioned the, the, um, like my first paradox, for example. Um, and then I have another paradox, Cami. She's probably, she's like nine, she turned nine this year because she was an offspring of key lime. So I retired her probably three years ago, but she's with one of my friends and living best life, like running up the stairs, going in her handbag down to this little beach bar. I mean, you know, she's got the life. So that's pretty much what I look for. So unfortunately as a breeder, I don't keep them through, their entire life, although I wish I could, but it just doesn't work out that way with housing. Um, my oldest one on site right now is probably seven that I have, that, that I still have, um, but I have plenty out there that are much older than that. But I have seen a decline in um, the lifespan of dragons throughout the industry, industry-wide, worldwide, um, versus, when I first started breeding. So, um, and when I first started breeding, one of the things that I did early on is I, I asked a lot of questions. So I used to do a lot of shows. I used to do a lot of, a lot of expos, a lot of expos. And so when somebody would come up to me and they said, you know, I'm looking for a dragon, my dragon has passed away. Um, 
okay, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, how old was your dragon? And then I find out more information. I ask questions. How old was your dragon? Oh yeah, how did you keep it? You know, oh, my dragon was 17 years old. Oh, that's awesome. You know, what did you feed your dragon? What kind of environment did you, did you provide for your dragon? So this is how I learned very quickly by not listening to necessarily um, my, you know, those that I was looking to, my mentors, which were great, by the way. Um, and I'm not talking anything down about them at all, but I learned to ask questions because you can learn a lot just from watching the general public with their animals and what they're doing with their animals and how they're keeping them and how long they live. Ask those questions. So when you have somebody come into your shop and they mention that they had a bearded dragon and you're finding out how long that animal lived, you ask a series of questions to determine why that animal either lived a long time or didn't live a long time. So um, typically it's those that had um, less, uh, um, they didn't get an absorbent amount of protein as an adult, had a longer lifespan. So my clients that had the dragons that lived the longest were not stuffing their animals full of protein. They weren't feeding them on a heavy feeding schedule like, like we see so oftentimes now where there's, you know, like this over care that's occurring. But I think there's a lot of reasons why that's happening. You know, it's because people um, want to, you know, everybody wants to show their animal on social media. So they want their animal to look the best. Fluffy is cute, you know, like being a little, you know, being a little thick, um, you know, is kind of popular. Um, and so, you know, the obesity, obviously we've covered on, we've touched base on that, um, not providing the multivitamins, this, that, and the other. And in addition to that, you have people in the, now buying bearded dragons that 10 years ago never would have bought a bearded dragon. When I first started, so I was in the jewelry industry for 20 years. <laughs> I managed like high-end jewelry stores. I used to sell Rolex, Cartier, this and that. And when I first started keeping dragons, then some of my clients at the store were like, what are you doing on the side? What are you keeping now? Like they were like, what is that? People didn't know what a bearded dragon was. They didn't know what one was which now that idea seems foreign. Because now when, when I say to somebody, they go, oh, what do you do? Or why this funny load of groceries that you, how many greens are you gonna buy? And, and you're saying, oh, I breed reptiles for a living. You know, like I primarily bearded dragons. Oh my gosh, I have one, da, 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 da. Or even here, oh my God, you're fairy tale dragons. Like I have, you know, my cousin has one from you or whatever. So it's like totally different now. So you have a lot of people that would not have necessarily had a reptile before. They never would have kept a reptile. So they're not somebody that would have been a reptile researcher. They wouldn't have necessarily researched everything that you need to research. So there's a lot of care mistakes out there. Um, and, and like I said, there's a, there's a lot of reason for that. You know, some of it is the genetic bottlenecking. Some of it there's 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 a laundry list of things that, that I could go through and, and bullet point of why this is happening, why we're seeing this. It seems like honestly, which most dragon breeders aren't honest about this, and most dragon breeders aren't willing to have the conversation because they're like, oh, they want to. It's almost like they. It's a topic that they're they're hesitant to talk about it. It scares them or something, but. I think right now, probably if I had to say, you know, what's the average lifespan for a dragon that's well cared for, I would say it's probably between five and seven years now. Really? Mm -hmm. You're not seeing the, the longevity that, that we did when I first started in this. So, and I think it's for a variety of reasons. Hmm shortcuts and whatnot mm -hmm. yeah like i said i mean there's probably i could probably sit here and list like 20 different things that i think are contributing to that and again how much of that is when people are line breeding how far are they going in breeding before outcrossing or not even outcrossing at all so right right yeah um, like there's there's some you know there's some of that going on now because you're trying to create extremes extremes come at a cost so anytime you see something in an extreme, there's, there's, you hit a point and then you can't cross that line. And if you cross that line, there's a price to be paid for that. So with yours then, obviously you obviously going to have to engage in line breeding and inbreeding as a part of line breeding. But at what point do you, 
is that intuition when you want to outcross or is it like do you have like x amount of years or um i outcross quite a bit i mean i don't i'm probably more cautious than most which is why i don't have some of the extremes in my lines that others do but i've been able to maintain um the size of a lot of my bloodlines are the size of my animals are quite large and i've been able to hang in there um more so than others um because I don't take it to the extremes. It's put me behind uh, as far as, it's put me behind as far as like, you know, when you're showing off a red or whatever, and it's like my reds can only get so red because I'm not willing to push that envelope to the next level, um, but I'm not willing to pay that price. It's not worth it to me. I don't care. I don't care. I'm not, it's not my goal to be like number one. Um, it's not my idea to be at the top. Um, or, or viewed at the top. My goal is to do the best I can and do the best I can for my animals. And if that puts me in the top 10%, great. Um, if it doesn't, whatever, like, I don't, I don't care. See, we have done pretty much what you said. We, we've bought a pair of babies, obviously female and male, and we are just kind of raising those up and just taking our time with it and doing it the way that we want to do it and then see where we get with that. And they, those are both very, very red. When you, obviously you're outcrossing it, are you outcrossing like a, a red to like a normal? How do you see that as different from buying maybe like a high red from abroad and putting that red to your reds? Because that would still be increased heterozygosity by doing that right um so i do a number of things i mean i'll take them to a normal or i'll take them to like some i mean i don't really have any normal normals i mean they all have some color but you know i have you know some lines that don't have a lot of color um but then i'll take those and cross them in and of course that bumps you back a little bit um, but i also do bring in occasionally i'll bring in a male from you know several males to grow out from outside and if they meet the specifications then you know, then, then I'll utilize those as well. So I don't really have like this one strict, like this is, I, I do so many things by feel. This is how I feel about this animal. This is how I feel about, um, you know, I, I can't, it's kind of an intuition thing at now at this point, because mm. I've been doing it so long. I just kind of do it and I don't know, I'll just do it. <laughs> I'm like, I know these two animals would work well together, you know? And most of the time they do. And if they don't, and I don't see the results that I want to see, I don't repeat the pairing. Very simple. So um, I, I think a lot of times people will hold back from a pairing that has less than optimal results because they want the look of that one animal. And that's a bad idea. I can tell you from experience, that's a bad idea. Don't do it. <laughs> um, you end up kind of, you, you pay for that. There's a line that I want to talk about, and it's red. And I think mm -hmm. you're already going to guess what that line is. Mm -hmm. And that's red monster. <laughs> mm -hmm. How much How much of that do you think is even fixable at this point? So, so you can take, I mean, I could take my reds and, and do that in just a couple of generations, no problem. Anybody can. Um, but you start to see a lot of problems, like a lot of problems. If you go through various accounts and you look at their animals, and I'm not talking about just the one ad they have for sale. I'm talking about the entire clutch. Look at the clutch when they hatch. Look across the clutch. And what do you notice? Very short bodied, you know, um, no neck, this, that, and yet like you start noticing like a lot of things. Um, so you may have one animal that visually looks okay, but that doesn't make the line okay. And as soon as you outcross them, that falls apart. So why, So in my opinion, it's just my opinion, um, I'm not willing to spend the dollars that's, that some of these lines ha you know, are asking for something that I know how it was recreated. And if I wanted to pay the price, I could do it myself. I'm just not gonna do it. So um, I have no, I am not going to, I'm not going to, for those, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, for anybody who wants to work with it, then that's up to them. They, everybody has to follow their own path. Um, me personally, based on my experience, my knowledge of dragons, 
my, you know, all of my background, that's not something that, that I'm going to chase. That's not something that I'm going to do. So. No, I strongly agree because I've had, um, I've looked into not just people who've purchased it, but what's happened to that animal along the line. Mm -hmm. And there's horror stories of um, them getting cancer before they've even hit sexual maturity. And at that point, it's like, I'm out. No. (laughs) Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not trying to, um, I don't, I just, everybody needs to keep in mind, you know, like when you, when you see these things pop up, cause it's going to pop, you know, there's going to be other names and other, this and other extremes mm-hmm. and you can only go far so far with a species that we can no longer bring it. You know, we can, we don't have access to necessarily, you know, new blood. I mean, you don't, mm-hmm. so you have to be very careful and very responsible about, you know, what you're doing. And, um, and I don't, I don't want that for, for people that own a dragon for me I don't I don't want their animal to get cancer when it's six months old I don't want it to fail to thrive I don't want them to you know take that animal that may reach adulthood and breed it to a female and have you know you know this huge variety pack of you know of animals as far as their structure and this that and the other so and some of that is going to be somewhat unavoidable anyway because of where we are um, with the dragon pool anyway Um, but I think each of us, it's a response. We have a responsibility to try to do the absolute best that we can, um, you know, with what we have to work with and, um, running those lines that tight for that long to get some of these results that we're seeing, um, there, there's definitely a really heavy price to be paid for that. And, and I don't think that's at all worth it. That's, that's not my game. (laughs) So would you say the amount of work you would have to take to fix all these other problems, you'd end up losing the the initial what makes it a red monster in the first place, I suppose? Mm-hmm. You can't you can't really fix that because it was created through line breeding to create that extreme. So anything that's that is a line bred, you know, um, you you hit this bumper. Whereas if you cross that bumper, once you cross that line, then um, you know, you start to really see some pretty horrific results um, across the board. You may have a few animals here and there that do great, but then you breed those animals with other animals to do your outcrossing and you still see that problem throughout the pairing. You just don't have the intensity of color. Like if you look at um, the halves um, that have been produced, um, you know, the color is largely lost. So um, some of it does develop over time, um, but I don't know, you know, it's, it's just not, I don't, I'm not trying to describe, I mean, there's some great breeders out there that are working with them and then I don't like to um, poo on anybody's project. So that's not, that's not my thing. Um, I'm just telling you from my standpoint, how I feel about it and my own opinions um, that's not something I personally am going to chase. That's not something personally that I want in my breeding program. So I don't, I, I don't want to cross that line because I know that there's a little kid out there who wants that is crushed when their dragon dies when it's a year old. And that is my, that is my driving force between behind trying to make sure that my animals are as healthy as they possibly can be, even if that's at the expense of not having the most extreme color or the most this or whatever. Um, because that's just, that's, that's important to me. You know, these, these kids are, um, you know, the next generation. These are the ones that are going to take my place and your place, you know, when, when we're no longer doing it anymore. And, um, and, and I don't want a kid having a negative experience from an animal that they got from me. You know, I mean, things happen. Nothing is perfect. When you're working with living things, it's tough. Um, and so, you know, things do happen, but I want as few things to happen as possible. Um, and whatever I can do to prevent that is, is what I'm going to do. Um, even if that means I'm not sitting at the top of the realm as far as, you know, the most extreme color out there, or the most whatever. Um, I'm perfectly okay with that. The long game, isn't it? It's the long game. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad. And, I and it's that like, and it's like you know, and like I said, it's the kids too. You know, like I didn't do expos for a couple of years because of the pandemic and whatnot, and you know, I um, 
but I still met clients locally. I don't allow anybody on property because this is my home. So, you know, for the privacy of my family and my neighbors and everything else, I don't allow anybody on property, but I do meet um, local families for pickup. And, you know, I've seen the kids light up, you know, the kids' eyes light up and, and even just grown kids, you know, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I'm a grown kid sometimes. Um, you know, it's, it's an emotional purchase. So I feel I have a responsibility to do it to the best of my ability. Um, I don't want to screw that up. I don't think you can ask for more than that, can you? So in terms of the babies then, how, how are you housing these babies? I know you said you're using tubs. Are they like open top with like lighting above them or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just use, I use an open, well, I have to actually I have two systems going right now. So, um, I have, uh, kind of the more traditional tub system, which for a breeder of my size, then that's really the best way to do it as far as being able to, you know, clean everybody and, and get to everybody. And, you know, so they have, um, they do have some cage furniture, so they do have ramps, this, that, and the other, um, to make sure that, you know, they're not nervous and, and whatnot and so forth. But for me, for, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to run necessarily, glass enclosures for the most part um and for me as far as ventilation this that and the other um for my environment uh i prefer the open tops um than i do the condo style which i've definitely used the condo style i used the condo style for quite a few years if you go back on my facebook account you'll see my condos that i use for babies and adults um but but the, but the bins allow me to just kind of like reach in, touch them, play with, you know, whatever, interact with them. It also kind of desensitizes them to anything that they would experience when they go into a new home, uh, you know, cause I'm coming in from above, but they're going to get that in a new home. Chances are it's going to happen in a new home. So they're already kind of desensitized to that and they're used to it. So there's a number of reasons why I use that system. Um, but it works out really well. And then I have an indoor outdoor system that, I'm not using for anything that I am currently retailing, but um, I mean, I could, um, but I've been using it with some of my holdbacks and that's working out really well where the babies come out during the day in enclosures and then they go back in uh, in the evening. So um, that's something um, we're on like the third system, like kind of tweak it and go back to the drawing board. I think people, a lot of times they, they start on something and they're like, oh, this is the only way to do it. They don't try anything new. People are afraid to try something new because they're afraid of failure, um, which for me is being like proactive and not wanting to mess anything up. I mean, it's hard for me to do that. Um, but Ron has really kind of opened me up to, hey, dum dum, you know, you, you really learn a lot of th- new things if you're willing to try this and that. So now I'm like, okay. So now I'm at the standpoint where I just say, you know, we're now I'm at the point um, in all of this where I'm like, okay, well, I think I want to do this and I think I want to do that and let's try this and see if this works. So that's how you get better is by being willing to, to step out of the box a little bit and do something new. Um, so, so the indoor outdoor is this third one is working actually really well and I like it a lot and it allows my babies to get natural sun. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got that going on too. So I'm currently running about 20 enclosures that are indoor outdoor for the younger ones, anywhere from baby to, you know, uh, a large juvenile into sub adult. So. That's really cool. So in some studies, they, they split clutches because it, be, it has to be the same clutch and same genetics for the control, but they would incubate half at a lower temperature and then half at a higher temperature the higher temperature ones obviously incubate for shorter come out smaller whereas the ones that left for longer come out and they eat better have you experimented with that at all or? um i have both mainly through non-intentional you know just sometimes things happen you get a, an incubation malfunction or whatever um like i had my incubator that was taken out by lightning actually two incubators got hit by lightning. Um, but I caught it really fast. I mean, I didn't have any uh, issues with it, but I could tell, um, there was some, you know, some size difference, um, in some of them that were in certain areas of development, but, um, certain stages of development. 
but I do prefer to incubate them at a lower temperature for a longer period of time. Like the 82 to 84 range works really well. That's what I prefer. Um, that's my preference. I don't, I don't like to incubate above 84 for a bearded dragon at all. And I won't. Um, I, I have a lot of lines where the babies come out and they are, um, you know, they're, they're hatching at four and a half, sometimes five inches, which is huge by industry standards nowadays. Um, so that's, that's my preference is that range in there. You got anything to add, Annie? No. I thought my last question I'd like to ask you is it what's what's for the future? What's your future plans? With dragons or just in general? Dragons more so, but in general as yeah. well. Um, so the dragons, I mean the only thing that's kind of I mean, I'll probably be doing dragons so I can no longer do dragons. So, I mean, I've been doing them so long that people are like, oh, were you going to move on to something else? Because I have all these different species that I'm working with now and enjoying and, and um, you know, new projects and stuff that I really enjoy as well. But the dragons, for a variety of reasons, will always have like a special place in my heart. So, I mean, I'll do them no matter what <laughs> for as long as I possibly can. Um, I think the one thing that I am, well, what I definitely in the process of doing is that um, I won't be breeding as many as I have for the last number of years. So the last couple, the last two years in particular, um, then not by large production facility means, but for me, I produced a lot of dragons um, and I do everything myself. So um, you know, I pair them, I, you know, I do everything A to Z with them down to when they go in a box and they're sold. So they are, like we've talked about before, they're extremely labor intensive. They're a lot of work. Um, and I personally don't like producing the number that I've produced the last two years. I don't enjoy it. Like I enjoy the dragons. Don't get me wrong. I don't enjoy the number that I've been producing. So I'd rather spend my time producing fewer and have, um, you know, time to do more interaction with like, you know, my retail customers online and, and, and do that and tailor down and, and drop down on the wholesale. I don't really like the wholesale thing too much. I mean, I, I like having, um, I mean, I enjoy wholesale. I have some great accounts that are like these fabulous, like high end, you know, like good, you know, I care mom and pop shop, independent shops. Um, but and I'm still going to do that, but not as many. So I'm going to be cutting the number that I produce probably by about 60%. So, which is pretty substantial, but the amount that I intend on producing next year, I can do with my eyes closed, <laughs> like, and still give everybody plenty of time and be able to, to list a few more dragons per week and have the interaction with, you know, the people that are out there that are actually buying them. Um, you know, as far as the, the families and the, and the, you know, young couples and, you know, the, the single person that wants a pet, you know, for some companionship or whatever. Um, but, uh, but that is one of my biggest plans for the future is just to, to drop that back so that I can really enjoy them more and spend more time with them. Um, cause right now I spend a ridiculous amount of time on, I mean, I have during the summer months, it's you know, 16 hour days, like just go from A to Z. And I still have other species that I'm taking care of as well. So I really kind of want to be able to enjoy all of them more and, um, and jump out of that race a little bit. Cause that, that, what, what the, the, the wholesale end of it, like the, the big box wholesale thing, that's not my game. It'll never be my game. I care too much for that to be my game. Um, but I like doing some wholesale because, because like I said, I mean, I like being able to service a, a number of um, pet shops, uh, high quality animals that I know that, you know, they have animals that are going to go home and grow and, you know, whatever and have a good experience. I want that, but not, not what I did the last two years. Not, not my thing. I'd rather drop that back and have more time with with the retail side of it 
um, and have more time for the other stuff I do too. So I breed um, banana pectinata, blue tongue skinks. Um, uh, you know, there's we have the anole project, um, crested geckos. You know, there's there's a, there's quite a few. Um, the frill dragons is something that's going to be incoming. So um, I want to work. You know, make sure that because it's really easy for you. You have to look. Everybody's different, and and I think you have to be able to look within yourself and say, is this best for me? Is this what I need to be doing? Like, is this my path? And so you really have to analyze like whether, you, no matter how many, you know, no matter what you keep and how many you're producing, you have to say, you know, like everybody has their limit. Everybody, you know, you get, you start producing um, X number and something has got to go, whether it's time with your child, which my daughter is 10, or whether it's, you know, time with the retail customer because you're, you know, because you don't have the, you know, there's only so much time. There's only so many, you know, like I said before, I mean, I only list X number of animals. It's not because that's all I want to offer, but I know that's all I can devote my time to. Um, so you constantly have to kind of play with it and say, okay, this is my comfort zone. This is what makes me happy. This is where I do my best work. Um, and so I never want to get to a point where I'm cutting corners or not giving it my best um, because I've gotten too big or because I'm not putting my focus in the right place. So, you know, it's like this huge balancing act. Um, so, you know, I had the opportunity, I, you know, definitely tinkered with larger numbers in wholesale. And like I said, it's not my thing. Um, I mean, I do fine at it as far as the quality of animal, but I don't, I don't, I don't get joy out of it. So, um, so I don't want to do that anymore. That's fair enough. I think you're probably. I can't. I can't think of any other breeder or any other niche of species that I think is going to the lengths of health that I've had a conversation with. So I think you're pretty much leading the way in that regard. Yeah, I mean, there's. I mean, there's a lot of really good breeders out there. I mean, there are. There's a lot of breeders out there that that really need to, you know step up their game and be open to making some changes and, and, and look at things from a different perspective, in my opinion. Um, but I mean, there's, there's a number of us working hard to, to do things the right way. And we all are a little different, you know, nobody, we're not all the same, you know, we're all different. So the way we do things and, you know, the way that we interact with our animals and, you know, what we want out of it. I mean, those are all, they're going to vary a little bit. Um, so, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, I think that people are kind of sometimes get a little bit too busy trying to one up one another instead of really trying to like one up yourself, <laughs> um, you know, and, and um, yeah, so I don't know. Fair enough. I feel like going into the future, you've got it all planned out. Well, I mean, over the way, I mean, you, you kind of, you know, you trip on this, you trip on that, you go, oh, I don't like this. Oh, I don't like that. This is the way I should be doing it. Not this way. Um, I'm extreme. I'm extremely observant. If anything, I'm an extremely observant person. And I notice very little things, you know, tiny little things. And I go, Ooh, <laughs> you know, like I need to do this and I need to do that. And you may not be able to necessarily do it in that moment, but you need to put it into your future plans. Um, so, you know, I constantly am writing lists and stuff and, um, you know, just kind of give myself, make sure keeping myself in check, I guess you could say, you know, like, am I doing this? It's like for, for me, for example, for example, I don't want employees, you know, I have friends that are breeders and they have employees and they do just fine with it and they love it. And that works for them. For me, it doesn't work for me. I don't want that. I want to stay in a position where I have control of everything that I see everything, not necessarily, it's not a control issue. I mean, it kind of is. It's a, I want to be able to see everything. I want to like, if, if an animal has even as simple as like, if they have an off poop, you know, if their poop is a little off, I may have put a mental note of that, or I'll even put a sticky note on their bin just so that I can keep watch. And it's like, okay, is there anything going on here? If I have an animal that, you know, isn't necessarily eating like I think they should be eating, I want to be able to make a mental note of that. I can't do that if I have employees. So, you know, at the end of the day, I'm accountable for every animal that, that I offer, whether retail or wholesale. So, you know, I try, I don't want to miss anything. 
And if you have employees, you're going to miss stuff. And that's for some people that's fine. And, and I don't, you know, that's, that's not a problem, but for me, it's just a real, I'm just like, Nope. <laughs> so I have to keep it at a level that I can comfortably do it and have fun and still be able to, you know, spend time with my daughter and, and, you know, my parents that are, you know, getting up there in years and, and have some life balance, which, um, you know, this past two years, for example, I didn't have much life balance. <laughs> so, cause I wasn't willing to, um, you know, take your feet off not, the gas. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to, I didn't want to not, provide and do everything that I possibly could for my animals. So, um, yeah. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I think we're hitting what hour mark is it now? It's like, uh, two and a half. So it's been a very, very good episode. I think it's been my favorite episode so far. So thank you very much for coming on Heather. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>